This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. TNA is the best wrestling in the whole world. Oh, shit! It's been Russo! Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold your horses there, uh, Mr. Nerd, is it? That's it. Oh, yeah, you can be king, king, king of these nuts. You know what I'm saying? I am the heartbreak kid, Shawn Michaels. Cousin. That's about some unadulterated bullshit. Welcome, everybody, to You've Got to Be Kidding Me, episode number 15, where we go through TNA history one month at a time. This month, we're talking about August 2003. I'm Garrett Kidney. I'm joined, as always, by my lovely scrappy co-host, Liam Jones. Liam, hello. <laughs> scrappy? Don't call me scrappy. We don't know what it means. You're like Scrappy Doo up in here. Everyone's favorite Scooby Doo character. Wow. Um, is that everyone's favorite Scooby Doo character? No, I'm pretty sure Scrappy Doo is widely reviled. Is that why he did the heel turn in the live action movie? Did he do a heel turn? I saw the live action movie. I don't remember it. He was revealed as the villain. That seems a very unscrappy Doo like behavior. I believe that was the reason that everyone hated him. Because, <laughs> like, Scrappy Doo is the classic. The show has been running too long. Let's introduce a new character. And then the new character is, that is introduced is one everybody ends up hating. Well, that, I feel bad for him now. What an understandable and relatable villain. Is that because I just called you Scrappy and now you relate to Scrappy-Doo? Yes. And again, Scrappy-Doo is not a villain in the actual Scooby-Doo canon. And the actual Scooby-Doo canon is the live action films. God, wasn't there like three of them? There was at least two. I can remember two, but would not be surprised by three. Because I remember I went to see one of them as part of summer camp in, like, fifth class. So I'd have been, like, 12. Mm. Maybe earlier. Maybe I was, like, 11. But, yeah, that was the film we went to see. We went to see the live-action Scooby-Doo movie as part of our summer camp. And an awakening was had for everyone as that movie is incredibly horny. Is it? Yeah. (laughs) So everyone is attracted to dogs because of it? No. (laughs) don't know why that was the bit you assumed. <laughs> it's, it's a Scooby-Doo, Liam. It's a Scooby-Doo movie. There are dogs everywhere. Yeah, I mean, there's like one dog everywhere. <laughs> we just discussed there's two. They're scrappy as well. Yeah, but was, he wasn't there until like the last ten minutes of the movie as the big reveal. Oh, uh, is that movie super horny? I don't remember it. Yeah, there is. Um, Velma and Daphne, it's like... um. They swap bodies at some point, and she's like, oh, I got boobs now. Everyone's in bikinis and such. Because who doesn't want to sex up the Scooby-Doo reboot? So you're just like, what do the kids want? The kids want boobs. It was was the sexy, edgy remix before Riverdale. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) You know, like, everyone's like, oh, yeah, Riverdale. It's like, (laughs) sexy Archie. (laughs) And now it's like, sexy Scooby-Doo, of which all other sexy programming came from. But, like, at least Riverdale is aimed at teens. That Scooby-Doo movie was aimed at kids. I don't know. Early teens, perhaps? I guess I was... No, if I was I was either 11 or 12, so I wasn't yet in my teens when I saw it. Your pre-teens. Mm. So that's Scooby-Doo. This is what I get for calling you Scrappy. Yeah, you get three minutes in Scooby-Doo. Other than Scrappy-Doo, how are you doing today? I am, yes... I have been not doing a lot, actually. Mostly because you just woke up? Yeah. I mean, like, in general. <laughs> Even rewatching Marvel films? Uh, yes. Uh, my roommate had never seen them. You consider Eternals one of the best Marvel movies? Top 15? You gave it four stars, which is, I'm pretty sure, when you sent me my, your spreadsheet, better than a lot of much better Marvel movies. I give most Marvel movies four stars. Unless they're, like, terrible. Which Eternals... Well, Eternals isn't terrible. It's mostly bland. I just liked it a lot. <laughs> I really did like it. I really had a great time in, jo- in watching it. I'm looking forward to, like, any more Eternal stuff that they get to eventually. What are they going to call the next one? Just Eternal? They're going to go... They're going to call it The Remaining Eternals. <laughs> ah. Spoilers, by the way. <laughs> I'm not... Oh, yes. Yeah. Movies have consequences. <laughs> To be fair, if there's any series of movies that actually don't have consequences, it's the Marvel ones. 
No, like three people died. <laughs> like one of the people who died, the very next movie they released was a movie about them. Yeah, but that was a prequel, it doesn't count. Ugh. And like half of the entire of civilization died, but they undid that. Mm. But like, you, I don't know, you knew that was going to happen, so... No, they should have committed to it. They should have left everyone half dead. That'd be very funny. It would have been very funny. It's just like, Spider-Man's never coming back. He's like, ah, I'm off to Sony. Or I can be in the Venom movies. Like, please, Mr. Stark, I don't want to go. <laughs> 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 Let me be in good movies, please, Mr. Stark. Hey, the Venom movies are probably better on average than the Spider-Man movies, so. It's not true. They're actually fun, enjoyable superhero movies instead of horrible, quippy Marvel movies. Oh, we get it. You totally like Marvel movies. You're so <laughs> interesting and cool. What a unique take. The Marvel movies aren't good. That's actually not my take, I'll have you know. I think the vast majority of them were good, but now they're extremely boring because they don't know what to do with them anymore. I just think you've lost all joy in your life because you no longer like any wrestling and you no longer like any of the Marvel movies. Listen, I liked this month of NWA TNA, so is, is, that's all that really counts, right? It's the most it's the most positive reflection on wrestling I've heard you say in maybe, like, three years. That's because most wrestling these days is bad, which is the reason we're back watching NWA TNA from 2003, which is, of course, the only good wrestling. I thought... <laughs> I thought we were... We were doing it for, you know, the money and fame. Ah, yes. All the money and fame that comes with podcasting about wrestling. Yeah. The, the sheer infamy you get from this genre of entertainment. <laughs> it, it's unmatched. Hmm. So, yeah, we're talking about August 2003. I said, I actually really liked this month on the whole. I thought it was fine. <laughs> I thought, like, there is absolutely nothing that I'm going to say is bad this month. I think literally nothing. There is nothing I'm going to be like, oh, God, we have to talk about this. I'll think of something. Yeah, well, yeah, you hate everything, don't you? You, you just want, I want to watch Ring of Honor. Yeah, good promotion. We're very combative at the start of this episode. Yeah. What's new? What's new? Eric, what's new? Wow. That could be his new slogan. Mm. What's world, what's new? <laughs> that works. That's pretty good, actually. Write that down. His new marketing slogan as the director of authority in TNA. Yeah. Because everything is new, given... It's Eric Watts' world now. Yeah, as, which I found it funny is, like, just jump around a little bit, not to get too into it, but, like, on the last show, they started with, like, a, it's Eric Watts' world now. He's going to change things and book things. And it's like, it wasn't in his world, like, three weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, and isn't the whole point here that it's only kind of his world? Because you also have Don Callis sniffing about? I, well, that's the power struggle, isn't it? Well, to be fair, Don Callis is using all of his power to exclusively fuck with Jerry Lynn, so... Which to, like, I actually admire being like, I am using my power struggle and my, my I'm throwing my weight around just to mess with one person who, for yeah. ill-defined reasons, I don't like. He also, like, he has actual work to do and it's mm. being put on the back burner just to fuck with Jerry Lynn. Also, if you look at the contributions to TNA history in this month as on-air characters, Don Callis invents Ultimate X. What does Eric Watts do? He invents war games. Excuse me, he invents Wednesday Bloody Wednesday. He invents war games. He does invent war games, you're right. So, you know, dead even heat here. If it was lethal lockdown, <laughs> oh, what, a, what a month that would have been. Well, basically, it is lethal lockdown, but still, there's no roof, I guess it's not lethal lockdown. Should we acknowledge this as, as the first lethal lockdown? Well, no, it has a different name. It's called Wednesday Bloody Wednesday. It doesn't mean anything. Lots of things have different names. A street fight is no DQ match. What the fuck? It doesn't matter. And uh, I, I get, well, the first Lethal Lockdown doesn't have the ceiling, but Lethal Lockdown does traditionally have the ceiling. This is I, I am making this declaration as the foremost TNA historian <laughs> that this is in fact the first Lethal Lockdown match in company history. We're not even going to talk about the match. The match doesn't even have to September. I don't know. I'm just saying. Um, we're going to brand that episode as first Lethal Lockdown. So, yeah, we're building all the way to the first war games in TNA history, the first lethal lockdown in TNA history that's built to this month. As mentioned, this is the month where Ultimate X was invented, which is pretty neat. Uh, we'll get into all of that. A lot of the brand, like, match types and names of things is coming out in this month and the next month. We got Ultimate X, we got the Super X Cup, we got Lethal Lockdown. Like, all of uh, TNA's stuff is, like, they're finding themselves here. 
And again, more so than last month, again, where like it's very settled now. Like there, there's no debuts this month, I don't think. At least nobody notable. I, I guess Bobby Eaton, does that count? <laughs> I, I suppose Bobby Eaton kind of counts. The disrespect to Terry Taylor. Ah, uh, yeah, Terry Taylor's there too as a backstage interview. But like, it, it's not the big surprises year anymore. It's not the swerves year anymore. They have just settled in. To like, this is their roster, and they're going to tell stories with this roster, and nobody is turning face or heel. The only character who's like weirdly ambiguous is Loki, and we'll get into that. But for the most part, it is like, these are who these people are, and we're actually being consistent for once. And it might be a big reason why I actually really enjoyed this month. Well, I definitely thought that this month had a certain vibe to it, mm. where it felt a little more well-defined, all in all. Like, there was um, a clear... I don't want to say motif, but there was a clear idea about this month. It just kind of felt like a real wrestling show. <laughs> Unlike what it used to be, which is like, who even knows? Yeah, like, half the time it was a, <laughs> a skit show, so... Uh, but we will get into all of that. We did the watch-along, if you'd like to listen to it, for NWA TNA pay-per-view number 59, August 20th, which is the show with the debut of Ultimate X. So that is at patreon.com slash kiddingme or tnachat.com. Now on our King of the Mountain tier, if you'd like to hear our full two-hour live reactions to that entire show and to the first Ultimate X match, of course, we'll talk about it in depth here too. And show notes, if you head to tnachat.com, you can see our show notes, which is this month seven pages worth of notes about what happened this month and all the backstage news and notes and all the happenings that happened on each of the shows, including some, some tidbits and whatnot. It's very funny that seven pages of notes is like a light week. I was thinking the same thing. It's like even broad topics because like the whole idea of this month is that you have intersecting stories that are building to a war games. So there's not even that many like huge broad topics but because a lot of them come together as one. The, the fact that it is such a cohesive month means that like maybe this will be a shorter episode but I thought that our last episode would be one of our shorter episodes and it ended up going over three hours. So who knows? It'll be a short episode but it'll be like two hours flat. Yeah. So, yeah, head to tnachat.com if you would like these seven pages of show notes. Again, basically a mini book chapter on August 2003 of TNA. And that's on the $1 tier. So it's a buck. A buck for a chapter of a book. And by the time we'll be done, it'll basically be a book. And us talking about it is basically an audio. Yeah, you get the, the, the context. It's like the director's commentary of the show notes. That's what the podcast basically is. Yeah, read along the show notes as we talk about them. So, August 2003, uh, notable because they, they're building toward their one cent pay view and the Super X Cup because, like last year, the fairgrounds are booked over the first weekend of September, so they can't run a show then. And again, the, the anniversary of 9 11, so they don't really want to run a show then either. So, TNA announced officially this week that September 10 will offer a best of TNA show at a cost of just one penny. As reported first last week, <laughs> TNA and the cable companies believe it will help lure new, in new customers if they expose them to their product. Because of TNA's limited syndication clearances and lack of any national cable clearance, they rely on publicity on the internet, cable satellite bill inserts, commercials, and word of mouth to sell their weekly pay-per-views. That hasn't really worked, as they're still only (laughs) selling about 8,000 to 16,000 a week on average. It's not too bad. (laughs) I I don't know know what I would have expected, but that seems about right. Well, when you think 8 to 16 is 80 grand to 160 grand, of which they get half of which is 40 grand to 80 grand. Based on the initial estimates, it was about 200 grand per show they needed. I'd imagine they've worked that down dramatically these days. But I listen, I can't really imagine why anybody would buy these shows on average anyway, so... I was going to say, like, to the 8,000 people that buy it every week, what are you doing? <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> It's it's not that expensive. It's 40 bucks a month for eight hours of entertainment. I guess that's that's not the worst. I don't know. I don't know if I would pay a $40 a month streaming service that showed four shows. <laughs> well, it was it was a different time. You have to compare it to... Oh, like... here we go. The classic Garrett defense of anything wrong. <laughs> it was a different time. But no, you do have to compare it to what the market was at the time, which was not a nine ninety nine streaming service for a bundle of content. Instead, it was the same forty dollar price tag for a single three hour WWE pay per view. So that's like the price comparison. So you're getting eight hours of TNA for the same price you're getting three hours of WWE. Okay, but the point you're not considering is that most of the time it's terrible. 
And like, I again, we've talked about this plenty of times. The biggest issue with these shows is they are booked like television instead of booked like pay-per-view. So you get stuff that just builds to stuff and they're perfectly fine doing DQ finishes and they're perfectly fine with weeks that just don't have like big hooks or big interesting matches. Though that's not really the case this month, to be fair. There's a bunch of stuff on these shows. Like there's AJ title matches on three of them. There's the first Ultimate X. There's the big gauntlet match. So th there's not many shows this month, at least, that have absolutely nothing going going for them like there were in some previous month where it's just like you guys charged people 9.99 for this absolute heap of garbage that's not even like trying to deliver on that value but there are weeks where that is the case and you are like oh the poor souls who actually paid money for this and then came back the next week and bought it again and kept coming back this loyal 8 to 16,000 people who come back every week unless there's like this big title match where they actually do a decent number the, the their loyal following every week watching these asylum shows mm. stockholm syndrome being abused by nwatna the beginnings of the same relationships we see nowadays with dub every fans well yeah now we just root for brands like we root for sports teams and who cares if it's bad it's just my personality to like it i want to be the guy going on forums and being like nwatna is actually really good you know i was actually thinking like trying to put myself in the shoes of fans in this period and trying to think about, like, would TNA fans be reacting to, like, Dusty Rhodes in TNA the same way AEW fans are reacting to, I'm not going to use CM Punk, that's too big an example. Brian Danielson. <laughs> like, 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 remember DDP did his little run and everyone was very excited? Or, like, Nick Gage? Is, is it, like, that equivalent to TNA fans at the time? It's like, oh, Dusty, hell yeah. No, because, like, it's more sustained. He's, like, an actual part of the show. Mm. It'd be like Jake Roberts. Yeah, or Aaron Anderson, or Tully. Yeah, something more like that. Because, spoiler again, Dusty's back, and he's once again, like, the best thing on these shows. I was gonna say, honestly, you know what it might be? Dustin Rhodes. Mm. Where it's like, you were just kind of happy for him. He's just out there having a good time, having good matches, being the best part of most of the shows he's on. Mm. Having that bloody war with Cody on that first show. I was I was actually thinking about that while watching some of these shows. It's like, well, because like I wouldn't have watched these shows at the time. As as we mentioned on our very first episode, I didn't start watching TNA consistently until the end of 2006. So I was trying to be like put myself in the shoes of fans at this time, thinking like, well, what, what, what would they think about this? What would like Dusty Rhodes or Larry Zbysko or Terry Taylor showing up? What would Mad Mikey jumping, you know, Bobby Eaton showing up be, be like, especially because he has the, the Midnight Express knockoff theme again. So... <laughs> What would that be like to the fans at the time? Would it be like that cool thing? Like, like you know, the, the AEW surprises or stuff like that these days. And I don't know. It's hard to put it. It's at a completely different scale, as mentioned. Like, there's eight to 16,000 people buying these shows every week and about 1,000 people in the building every week, most of which is papered. And that compare that to AEW, which does, I think, on average, 5,500 and about 800,000 to a million on TV every week. Completely different scales. So it's hard to, like, match them. But... Yeah, that was the thing I was thinking about. I think for the most part, people are probably really into it. it I, it's hard to get angry at a legend doing an appearance. Because mm. you kind of just, like, it's the easiest to turn your brain off and just enjoy this segment thing that you can do. Especially when it's not, like, in an overbearing, like, great Muta shoving Kaito Kiyomiya down a <laughs> flight of stairs. Away. <laughs> That's not a, a legend doing an appearance. That's a sustained main event push. That is a dude just keeping other people down. So when it is just like Dusty popping up to do cool six-man tags and undercard feuds with Glengilberti, and we'll see some main events about Dusty stuff coming in the next few months. But for the most part, he's there to elevate the people around him. He's not there to hold the people around him down. How nice of him. TNA officials are said to be relying heavily on the money for that their overseas television deals bring in to make up some of the losses that the North American pay-per-views are still posting. The word going around is that TNA is bankling heavily on the one-cent pay-per-view concept scheduled for September to lead to improved pay-per-view sales. I don't know if they should be. Well, like, the idea is they can't get television clearance. They can't, like, market. Again, we talked about this in previous episodes, but, like, the internet is a much smaller, much more contained space these days. So, like, the idea of going viral is reaching a thousand people, not, like, ten million. So... It's, it's a completely different world of promotion. So their idea here is, well, maybe if we offer the best of our best from our first 12, 13 months, put it on pay-per-view for a cent, being like, listen, this is our proof of concept. This is who we are. And maybe they can trick people into thinking that's actually who they are instead of like the Dups and Vince Russo. I, 
listen, I don't think it's going to have a giant bump. It'll probably have a little bump. I just think you're probably going to be, you're going to end up losing money on this because you're going to have like 20,000 people paying one penny instead of 16,000 people paying full price. But they don't have to produce a show, so there's no like overheads for it. I just meant in general if they were to try and continue this concept. Oh, well, yeah, that's they just give it away for free, <laughs> you know? But I think that's like a logistics thing, as we as we noted a couple of weeks ago, is that like it's actually just hard to do free at this point. And like not all the pay-per-view providers are actually taking the one cent pay-per-view. Uh, it's in demand that R and Dish or Direct. One of them isn't anyway. One of them is getting a different special for full price. So even just selling this, like the, the idea of the one cent pay-per-view to the pay-per-view providers is a hard sell. Hmm. A correction from last week that we have to issue on behalf of PW Torch now. There, there was a misquote about the unimpressedness of the video game companies about the TNA product. He meant to say impressed. So PW Torch was wrong, therefore we were wrong. Sorry about that. No wonder we had like a five minute debate about it <laughs> and about the structuring of the quote. We were also, last week we said Corsica Joe's name was Corsica Jones, which was uh, technically my fault because I put it in the notes as Jones, then read it as Jones, then you repeated it as Jones. And while I was listening, I was like, correct it, correct yourself, Garrett, it's Corsica Joe. And then I didn't, we just ran with Corsica Jones. His name is Corsica Joe. Nobody spotted that, nobody pointed it out. I'm actually very upset that our listeners aren't big enough pedants to go, actually, it's Corsica Joe, but it's Corsica Joe. I know you said that name so many times. You're not a big fan of Corsica Joe? I d- <laughs> it was just a lot, okay? It was just a lot to, to take in. So yeah, feel free to be pedants if we're ever wrong about something. Point it out. Like, drag us over the coals. That's what the internet is for, right? I mean, did you not hear us cry about it for 15 minutes? Yeah, we did spend like so much of last week's episode on the internet, so that's true. Scott Hudson is scheduled to work up going TNA shows, so it appears that Goldilocks isn't coming back anytime soon. The word going around is that The Office became frustrated with her repeated requests to be written into scripts rather than simply serve as the backstage interview host. How dare she want to be a part of the show? Well, she will come back as a character eventually, but for now, it's Scott Hudson and Terry Taylor for a week's job. Uh, thank God S- Scott Hudson's available. He is very good. I, was, I, was, I tweeted this yesterday, but TNA's history of like backstage interviewers is really, really good. They know how to pick them. Even like this year, you have Goldilocks who like... She's weird in a very weird way, making her faces, but she's she's entertaining. <laughs> but also, like, I think it, Goldie got, like, turned down in that she got bored eventually. Mm. And when she got bored, you could, you could see it. When she wasn't paying attention to the interviews, she was just like, Ooh, do, 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 do. her brain just goes away. I mean, like, not even that. I just mean, like, the second year in, you could tell that she wanted to do more than just hold a fucking microphone. Hmm. So Scott Hudson is our backstage interviewer for the time being, and as mentioned, Terry Taylor for one episode. At least it's one episode. Valentina was backstage at the August 20th show, but not used. TNA officials are set to be reassessing the role of the bitch slap girls. One source reports that the women will be used again, but there is some talk of repackaging them and dropping their feud with the TNA girls. So after a whole month, Liam, of these people doing pull-aparts, they just disappear for the month of August. Feud is a generous terminology. They did do the same angle over and over again. It's like an episode of AEW Dynamite. <laughs> but yeah, the bitch slap girls gone from August television. I find that fascinating. And I find, I find it fascinating that it, like, it works in months like that. Because like, we cover the show arbitrarily month by month. But like TNA obviously don't have to book month by month. But somehow it's like, oh, the bitch slap girls just didn't appear in August after being on every show in July. It feels like it works like this a lot. It does. It's it's very weird how even TNA are like, well, start of the month, let's let's clear house from some angles and stories that aren't working. Amazing Red did more damage to his injured leg during an All Japan match last week. Friends of Red have been telling him to take time off and let the injury heal for weeks, so now there's a lot of told I told you so whispers since the latest injury, which is expected to require surgery and months of time off. Man, why I gotta be mean about it? Yeah, so he got that MRI, for some reason continued working on it, and hurt it even more. As mentioned, we won't be talking about Red much until March 2004, that's the next time he shows up in TNA, because of this injury. It's wild to me that he just went on another All Japan tour, knowing his knee was bad, but listen. Hey man, gotta make that money. It's the life of an independent wrestler, I guess. And it's like, it's a completely different era. Like, James Storm got a concussion in the last show of this month, and went on to work the War Games match, which was taped that night, even though he got a concussion. Which is just like... That doesn't happen now for very, very, very good reason. But again, different times. Yeah. 
Oh, I shouldn't have scrolled down. Now where am I? TNA officials are trying to strike a talent exchange deal with Puerto Rico's IWA in the hopes of using more Hispanic cruiserweights in the X Division. There you go. Uh, we have seen one IWA star in the past. Do you remember who it was, Liam? I believe you are referring to Apollo. Indeed, who was a pushed entity in the first couple of months of TNA, where they clearly, like, we think there's something here, but we're not sure what's here, so we're going to kind of push him, but then not push him, and then he's not very good, so we're going to stop pushing him. I enjoyed the brief Apollo uh, heavyweight run. He does throw a good super kick. Mm. So we may be seeing more IWA stars from Puerto Rico in the coming weeks and months. The, probably the biggest note this month, and it, I think there is a very clear catalyst for why it happened, but NWA TNA handed out one-year merchandise contracts to his wrestlers prior to Wednesday night's show. I believe this was the August 20th show. While the top wrestlers took the contracts in stride and some of the younger wrestlers were thrilled to receive their first contracts, some of the mid-card talent who had worked for major companies in the past were concerned over the terms of the deal. Although the wrestlers were told that the deals are strictly for merchandise purposes, some of the veteran wrestlers are of the opinion that the contracts would prevent them from working for WWE. The general concern amongst these wrestlers is that if they sign the contracts, they will not only give up any chance they have of working for WWE, but also lose negotiating leverage with TNA. The wrestlers have been told that they can attempt to renegotiate their deals before the end of these contracts, but the wrestlers wouldn't have any leverage in that scenario because TNA would already have them signed throughout the year. The wrestlers are also contracted because of the standard mid-card contracts are worded in a manner that suggests that TNA officials do not have to guarantee the wrestlers a particular number of dates throughout the year. So TNA have decided to actually start like locking people down, and there's a very good reason for this, because Alexis Lurie signs a WWE deal this month. Hmm. I like how the write-off was like, we're going to cut some hairs. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to trim her hair a little and she'll never be seen again. And like, this is not the first person. We had Paul London being poached in the last few months as well. So I do think they've reached the stage where it's like, these are the young promising stars that are we're hoping to be the next AJ Styles or the next America's Most Wanted. So we need to start locking them down because WWE are going to start taking them instead. Because like, also Alexis Lurie would have been like their women's star mm-hmm. for the foreseeable future because she was the only one actually being pushed as a wrestler yeah it would have felt like her and trinity would have been like the foundation of that division Mm. and there was desire before she broke her back of course yes but even desire was more of a uh, personality yeah whereas trinity and alexis are getting like in the nitty-gritty doing mood salts doing ddt's getting their hair cut having fireballs thrown at them the general stuff that comes with pro wrestling in tna (laughs) yeah i was gonna say the you know the tna experience through and through so yeah, they lost Alexis Lurie, they lost Paul London, and now they finally reach a stage where they're like, all right, it's time to start locking them down. There are some wrestlers who think the concerned mid-carders are making too big of a fuss over the situation. Where else are they going to go, one wrestler asked. If Vince wanted them, he would he already would have had would have called. Which is kind of harsh, but also very true. Damn, what the fuck? But, but like, listen, if you're TNA and these guys are like, we don't want to sign contracts, we want to potentially go back to Vince. It, it is a little like, it's a little filtering system, isn't it? Of like, well, these people don't really care about being here. I don't know, but can, can you blame them? Like, there's one money place in the business at this point. That's true. But if TNA keep having their stars poached, there will never be a second. That's fair enough as well. But that requires faith, and would you put your faith in this company, in a company that's constantly disappointing you and working you? No, no, I probably wouldn't. Yeah. To be fair, August 2003 TNA is only kind of like that, we'll talk about that later in the the episode. Yeah, but I don't know if, like, the other nine months of me being here would convince me otherwise. (laughs) Many of the TNA headliners, including AJ Styles, Raven, and America's Most Wanted, have already signed one-year deals. The word going around the locker room is that TNA officials are trying to sign most of the wrestlers who are working under one-year deals to one-year extensions. So they are trying to become a real wrestling company now. After, you know, signing people to short-term deals, trying to signing people to half-year deals, they're like, we need to start getting this roster locked down. And uh, uh, to be fair, you, you kind of see that on the show as well, as we mentioned, that they do have a much more consistent roster. I like contract talk. I'm looking forward to that being a thing moving forward, even more so. I just find it interesting. Just the, the like the, the 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 thought process that goes into like if you're a D'Lo Brown, I don't know, is he the person, one of these people in the mid card who are wary? But he, he, I'm just picking an example. If you're a D'Lo Brown sitting and like looking at how be, you've been used in TNA so far, would you be a guy that's like I want to tie myself down to this company? Probably not. Yeah, it's interesting, right? And. Uh... Like, how sure are you that you were going to go back or go there for the first time? 
you know, whereas the contrast with someone like Raven, who has been heavily pushed, heavily featured, and has maybe already burned his bridge with WWE, he's probably like, yeah, sure, I'll take a contract. Mm. And he's like, I'm allowed to work other places still. It's just, yeah, TNA has a right of first refusal on both my dates and my hair. Again, we'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> I was going to say, we're, we're getting into the the point that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, where um, TNA start, has started requesting and asking other companies to kind of filter everything through them. Mm. Which, to a degree, I get, because, listen, you're the national cable company and you don't want some other small indie company using your contract at stars in a way that you either disagree with or which harms your company but also you're still tna come on yeah well because like there's i think there's a level to it like hey uh, we don't want our world champion to lose to poland and that's probably fine right but to <laughs> i remember the, the one line was that they were gonna ask companies to continue their storylines if they booked their guys oh so use them like tna are using them yeah, so if you wanted Raven and you had to see a punk on your show, you had to continue the Raven punk stuff. Or if you wanted AJ on your show, you had to continue, like, sort of that character, which was an interesting choice. And I remember, this is coming from the Through the Years podcast, obviously, uh, Ring of Honor was like, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Especially because, like, the, the AJ Styles that is on TNA is very different to the AJ Styles that's on Ring of Honor as, as a performer. He even talked about it. We, we mentioned the quote about it on the last episode where he's like, I'm doing sports entertainment in TNA and I'm doing wrestling in Ring of Honor. I believe the big um, sort of impetus for all this was the um, Raven and working obviously really big roles in both Ring of Honor and TNA at the same time. That's kind of what um, brought it around. But we also did see it with AJ uh, a couple of months ago with the Paul Allen stuff. Hmm. An interesting part of the contracts given out is that they include medical insurance. No idea to what extent, and obviously I don't believe that lasted very long, but listen, I guess it's something. I I think rest. This is my bold take, Garrett. Mm-hmm. I think wrestlers should be given medical insurance by the companies they work for because it is a business in which they hurt their body literally every day. That is a bold take. Don't I know it. James Mitchell was contacted by someone in WWE about coming in to manage Mortis, or at least he was telling people that, but he was also, he is also given the impression he might not take the offer. He was thinking he could earn more money at his regular job in Orlando than going on the road for 500 payoffs and having to pay road expenses out of that since the downside guarantee for someone like him would be very little. The night a week thing allows him to get his wrestling fix while he also still works his shoot job. So it's, it's kind of wild that he's like, the pay is not worth it for me to go to WWE. Well, I remember for a few people, that's just how it was. It was like... You know, having to pay for your travel stuff is legitimately, like, pretty insane. Mm. It just reminds me of the Bailey interview every time someone brings that up. Oh, God, that popped into my head yesterday as well. I can't even remember why. But, yeah, I heard sitting there awkwardly with the person being like, oh, is that not covered in your collective bargaining agreement? And Bailey's like, no. <laughs> and it's like, uh, you know, oh, uh, we, we do it for the universe. We're very well looked after. It's like, you have to drive yourself from show to show and then put yourself up in a hotel? And she's like, y- y- yeah. And then the interviewer's like, that's insane. Yeah. Uh, it, it's always fun when the real world gets a glimpse into the wrestling business. Mm, let's just see the, the bizarre ways in which this industry operates. Like, I forget who was, who did the, like, the big piece on the the union stuff and on, like, the Saudi Arabia stuff. Oh, was it last week tonight? Sure. John Oliver's show? Yes, 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 yes. I didn't realize, I didn't actually know what his show was called. But they, that's so funny, because like so many people, people sent me that. You're the wrestling guy, have you, have you, have you heard of this? Yeah, like, did you know? And I'm like, yeah, we all know. We are aware of the state of which the industry operates in. <laughs> Trust me, we're desperate for them to do something about it, but no one does. That's what we call a monopoly in the industry, my friends. I think we're allowed to have those, Garrett. Mm. Where's the fair trade? <laughs> this is the free market, Liam. It's it's operating as intended. Wow, looks like we're all paying for the free market. Oh, I see what you did there. Oh, yeah, I'm teaching a college course. <laughs> Please come with me. To... <laughs> Liam's master class on social politics. Mm. Welcome to my TED talk. Uh, your t- t- TNA ad talk. Yeah, that's something. My Ted Turner talk. Uh, I wish Ted Turner got back in the wrestling business. Created a new company. Oh, uh, you want him to be the third company? Yeah, Ted Turner. Just 
do it again. I saw like um some people, and I'm sure it was a joke, but I found it very funny who who um got like faux mad at Mark Cuban for making for trying to make affordable medicine <laughs> instead of starting a pro wrestling company. <laughs> Wait, he has two choices. It's like affordable medicine or wrestling company. Obviously, you choose the wrestling company, right? I mean, for us, right? It seems like the natural choice. Yeah, especially since we would have booked it, obviously. Mm. So those are your main news notes for the month. The big one being that TNA are starting to offer contracts and that they are building to the one cent pay-per-view in September. All right, Garrett, I'll, I'll, I'll propose a little fun game for you. Okay. You are the NWTNA in 2006, August, right? 2003, but sure. 2000, why, why? Well, I read August 6th on my screen, and that's why I got mixed up. I'm going to give you five contracts for contact, contract for current workers that are working on the show. Mm-hmm. I want you to offer them out right now, not including America's Most Wanted, AJ Styles or Raven, because they are already signed. So everybody else, who do I offer a deal to? End of August, so Alex 3, go on. It's a weird roster. I'm not sure. <laughs> mm. uh, Chris, Chris Saban. Saban. No. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. You love to see it, don't you? <laughs> Saban is the obvious one. Daniels. Yeah, Daniels is a good one. I'd probably go D'Lo. D'Lo. Because I think there's a lot in D'Lo, even if they're not getting a lot out of D'Lo. The question is, like, Corso, who are you scared that is going to get picked up as well? Because, mm, like, WWE are probably never going to come for Michael Shane. <laughs> actually, that's a big one. They, they actually talk about that because Michael Shane wins the X title this month. We'll talk about it. But he, he's X champion and he doesn't have a contract. So they're like, oh, he mm. is an in with the WWE. Did you know he's Shawn Michaels' cousin? So they might pick him up. <laughs> uh, I have some things to say about that angle, but we still have three more contracts to offer. I would say Jerry Lynn, but I'm not worried that they would take him. Mm. Abyss. Uh, you see, I was thinking Abyss too. Because Abyss feels like a guy Ron they, Killings. they would come for. And Ron, yeah, and Ron is teased going back. Remember, he's talking about going back to work with Cena. Yeah, Saban, D'Lo, Abyss, Ron Killings, and Daniels. Those are my five. Yeah, I think that's fine. I think that's about right, too. Interesting, one of them that we didn't pick is CM Punk. Well, it's because he's not a TNA guy. Mm-hmm. Despite being on the show, he doesn't feel... He's never felt like a TNA guy. He feels like this weird copy paste that shows up on the show and you're like why are you you shouldn't be there's some weird like multiverse shit where you've just like appeared here somehow but you shouldn't be here i was say i enjoy him in the gathering yeah but he just doesn't he never feels right but like to be fair like none of the segments are meant to be about him he's just like a third wheel in every match he's in but like he's, he's yeah he, he, I, I can never associate him with tna though well he's gonna be on the show for another like year so working tags yeah him and julio i would sign julio oh who are you gonna drop daniels abyss probably oh (laughs) yeah that's a good choice drop abyss for julio de nero hey just because tna couldn't get him over doesn't mean he's not a star all right that brings us to broad topics for the month let's start given that it's a very historical month with the x division oh what happened in the x division this month it's not about weight limits liam it's about no limits wow it's about cool match types Yes, so this is the month that Ultimate X came about. We had the first Ultimate X match. The build to it began on NWA TNA pay-per-view number 57, August 6th, 2003, in which, once again, we had another is Chris Saban against Frankie Kazarian x Division title match. Uh, the first one was fine. I don't think these two have great chemistry together. And, like, good God, do the crowd just not give a shit about these two when they wrestle each other. <laughs> which is funny, because I think they care about them when they're not wrestling each other. Like, yeah, they care about Kaz when he wrestles Michael Shane, and they care about Saban when he wrestles Michael Shane. Yeah, so it's very weird that, like, just when these two go in the ring with each other, it suddenly becomes like a black hole of charisma and the crowd fall asleep. It's weird. And it's like, it's not for lack of trying, because they try really, really hard. Yeah. <laughs> like, they come flying out of the gate in this match. They're really trying. Clearly the thing here is that um, Michael Shane is just the glue that holds it all together. He's the big star. It's, he's Shawn Michaels' cousin. I kind of love Michael Shane. Yeah, we'll talk about him in a sec. Because this match, Saban wins with a belt shot. Then Andrew Thomas restarts the match. Mike Posey's the referee. Andrew Thomas comes out, restarts the match. Mike Posey's like, no, Saban won. Then Kazarian hits the wave of the future to win the belt. But then Mike Posey's like, no. And then Andrew Thomas is like, no. So Rudy Charles runs out, takes the belt away and says, Eric Watts is going to solve this problem. <laughs> Eric Watts is the champion. Yeah, this is um, this is classic TNA overbooking a simple situation. I 
And it's something that we don't talk about <clears throat> anymore because, you know, we're kind of used to it, but it is still kind of insane that these uh, finishes we're getting on pay-per-view. Mm. But like, well, the idea here is because Shane on the show beats Shark Boy, Joy Matthews, and Danny Doring. I nearly said Joe Doring. Danny Doring. Oh, what a match that would be. Michael Shane, Joe Doring. Yeah, but he beats Shark Boy, Joy Matthews, and Danny Doring in a four way match to become number one contender, kind of. I don't think they expressly state that. But they then still need to give Kazarian a claim to number one contendership so that next week they can do the ladder match between Shane and Kazarian to determine the actual number one contender. So they, they've, like, created this little web for themselves where they have to do a shitty finish. Mm. And, like, there is the usual thing. It's like, they booked this shit. They didn't have to back themselves into that corner where they had to do, like, a cheap finish here and then a cheap finish the following week, but they did. Yeah, 100%. Before that match, the, the Shane Shark boy, Joey Matthews, and, and uh, Joe Doring. Danny Doring. God damn it. <laughs> Joe Doring. Before that match, I wrote Doring in the notes. That's my mistake. I didn't expressly state Danny Doring, so Joe comes to mind. No, don't you write Joe Doring in the notes. That'll make it worse for me. <laughs> <laughs> but before that match there was little pre-match interviews with all four guys in which the first words out of Michael Shane's mouth on TNA were yeah I'm Shawn Michaels cousin see okay at this point like they're still doing like the original like hey it's just kind of being used to play him over but by the end of the month it's gone full parody of itself and I love it yeah so you see the point of this one is kind of like I may be Shawn Michaels cousin but I'm all my, all my own man blah blah he's trying to downplay it and by the end of the month, he has fully embraced the fact that he's Shawn Michaels' cousin. Oh, I, w- I can't wait to talk about the promo at the- on the last show. <laughs> yeah, there was also a tremendous Shark Boy Norman Smiley promo where, like, Norman was, like, trying to get him to-, to focus on the match and all Shark Boy wanted to do was the big wiggle. Can't blame him. So, yeah, Shane won that four-way. Then we had the, the horrible finish in the Saban and Kaz match to set up the following week. NWTNA paper number 58, a ladder match between Frankie Kazarian and Michael Shane to determine number one contender. Which was um pretty good, but and it's no fault of their own. I just can't stand ladder matches anymore. Yeah, there's a lot of mad ladder matches. I thought they, they absolutely worked their ass off. They took some like just hideous bombs. Sunset flip power bombs off that ladder. Uh, Frankie could uh, hit the Jeff Hardy like leg drop over the ladder, which is, must be just hideous for your spine. I'm sure most of what they're doing is hideous for their spine. Thank God they got those medical... Uh deals <laughs> yeah well well done you'll be fine you, you you have the medical deal that's why they were taking the bumps they're like well well uh, mike Tanay mentioned the the ring of honor match between michael shane and paul london yes that match was wacky and dangerous they used a real flimsy ladder just i believe a big ring of honor law here that that was the beginnings of the paul london please don't die chance well he, he probably earned them <laughs> he did that ladder was scary yeah, Mike today was pointing out their ladder match history and pointed out that while Michael Shane has never been in a ladder match, that was a no DQ match that turned into a ladder match. Mm-hmm. So yeah, they they have the match. By the way, Eric Watts just gave the belt back to Chris Saban after the contentious finish of the the previous week's match. That was Eric Watts' big decision that he will give the belt back to Saban and do this ladder match to determine the number one contender. He's like, I got a big thing with Loki and AJ. Shut up. Let me just. <laughs> Just give it back. <laughs> and the funny part was like, we never even saw Watts deliberate or make that decision. It's like, we have a backstage interview with Scott Hudson and, and Chris Abram. Chris Abram's like, yeah, Watts gave me the belt back. It was the only decision he could make. Which is like, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Watts is just very busy doing other things, which is the reason, obviously, because th- this match ends in a no contest. When Chris Abram runs out, he takes out both guys off the ladder, then grabs the contract himself. So I'm pretty sure he has to wrestle himself for the exhibition championship now. I wonder who would win. Oh, Chris Abram. Mm, I think I have to go with Chris Saban. Oh, yeah, you know, that's a good point. He's scrappy. (laughs) Don't you get us back down that rabbit hole. (laughs) But because Eric Watts did such a hideous job solving this problem, Don Callis comes out and confiscates the X Division title and he will come up with a solution. The actual person running this show. Yeah, we'll talk about the the differences between Callis and Watts when we get to other stories of the month, but they try to explain that and I think they make it worse. (laughs) So later in the show, Don Callis, he has a little whiteboard and he has drawn himself a structure. It's, he's called it the Ultimate X Match, where he, they will hang four poles from either side of the ring, have cables crisscrossing the ring, where the belt will be hung in the middle. It will be a ladder match without the ladders. You climb the cables to grab the belt. You've seen an Ultimate X Match at the stage. You don't need me to describe the Ultimate X concept. You can look at our cool poster. The poster for this month is an Ultimate X poster. It looks real rad. Ultimate X is a cool match type. It's one of those matches that you immediately associate with TNA. It's one of those things that really made TNA stand out, especially when I was first getting into it, because especially at the age that I was starting to watch TNA, like, the thing that I was into was the X Division. Like, this is the reason I was watching it, and Ultimate X was one of those, like, 
mind-boggling things that you'd see. And, like, like Elevation X2, you're like, this is just so absurdly dangerous looking. Why is this a thing? But you got to admit, like, these unique and new match types are so sorely missed nowadays. Why can't we get more weird structures in wrestling? I want wrestling to be basically... Have you ever seen... I don't want to say professional, because I don't know if it's professional, but, um, like, official league tag? No. Where they do tag on, like, these parkour-like structures, and they're, like, flipping all around them and doing crazy shit trying to win these games of tag. It's like gymnastics meets tag. And I am desperate for someone to be like, we need to put this in and around a wrestling ring. Where you just put all the exhibition guys with a bunch of things they can do cool shit off? Yeah, like, they have these, um, like, there's, like, monkey bars, and there's, like, these metal stairs, and there's all these things that you can run across and jump across, and I just... Like, Ultimate Ninja Warrior means tag. But I think, like, imagine if you did a wrestling match with that. It would be nutto. Especially today. Like, chuck Nick Jackson in that? And Phoenix? <laughs> Some crazy shit's gonna happen. It feels like an idea you could pitch in the NXT 2.0 writing room and actually get done. Yeah. But yeah, uh, Don Callis announces the ultimate drama, ultimate danger, ultimate X. As mentioned here, there's a little drawing of it, which uh, it's like, oh, that's cute. He drew his ultimate X. I wonder if JB drew that. I do wonder who did draw the Ultimate X drawing. I, I hope it was Don. He just sat down and was like, listen, I really do have this idea. It's really cool. <laughs> do we actually know who is, like, officially credited with the Ultimate X idea? There is a note this month that, that like, the, the, the co-brain trust of Jarrett Gilberti, Damore, and Russo take credit for it as, like, a collective. Well, congratulations, Damore. <laughs> There is actually a fun note about the construction of the Ultimate X, which we'll talk about in a minute, and the fact that the belt fell, but that's a different issue altogether. But yeah, Don Cass' solution is that Chris Sabin will remain X Division champion, but he will defend the belt against Shane and Kazarian in this new fancy invention, the Ultimate X match. Very exciting. Which brings us to NWA TNA Baby number 59, August 20th, 2003, the debut of Ultimate X. They had fancy Ultimate X graphics beforehand. Fancy is probably a, a very generous term here. <laughs> They had graphics. They did have very 2003 graphics about the Ultimate X. Yeah, um, JB opened up his, not Premiere Pro, what's the one where you make graphics? Some Adobe program of from 2000 and was like, I'm going to make some cool graphics for this show. It's like After Effects or Photoshop. Yeah, there you go. Or... That's what I was looking for. So yeah, making his Ultimate X graphics and they do look, to be fair, Don, Don Callis' drawing is probably better than the graphics, but here we are. They should have just plastered the Don Callis graphics. <laughs> They should have animated it. That would have been fine. They, uh, yeah, it comes off of the whiteboard and turns into a real logo. So, Michael Shane defeated Chris Sabin and Frankie Kazarian to become X Division champion and win the first ever Ultimate X match in a match that was a disaster due to no fault of the wrestlers. Yeah, this was insane. So, the the biggest problem with this match, it's not the Ultimate X that you know. The Ultimate X that you know is the, the two cables crisscrossing and they're connected in the middle and they're red covered cables. Whereas here in this match, it was two cables that were not connected in the middle. So you had a cable crossing from one corner to the other and a cable crossing from the other corner to the other. And while they did meet in the middle, they weren't held in the middle like the, 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 the Ultimate X is, the, I think, every single Ultimate X after this is. So when they hung the belt up there and every time somebody tried to climb the cable, the two cables would stretch and would end up releasing the title belt and causing it to fall to the mat, not once in this match, but twice. <laughs> Let's talk about um the referee here. <laughs> oh, poor Andrew Thomas. Poor Andrew Thomas picking up the belt and being like, oh god, what do I do? <laughs> yeah, like a solid 30 seconds of silent reflection about what to do in this circumstance. Because he moves into like the back corner of the ring. He's in like the top left corner of the ring. And he's just hovering. I'm, I assume he has somebody in his earpiece while everybody's like collectively panicking. But there's like, he wants to disappear in this moment. He's just like, oh no, what do I do? Like a disappointed father le leaning over his kitchen bench. So eventually one of the security guards comes out and like goes to like traverse the cables to put it back up. And then nopes the fuck out of that. <laughs> He's like, nope, nope, nope. And they bring a ladder out to hang it back up. And they wrestle again some more. And it falls again. And they bring the ladder back out and hang it back up. And they wrestle some more. And then they finally finish the match. Michael Shane becomes exhibition champion. I find, like, the critical response to this match at the time was that it was, like, mind-blowing and amazing. Which I kind of get. Because, like, we've seen, uh, like, 60 Ultimate X matches since then. We know, like, the lengths to which people can go in this match type. But I guess, like... Taking out the two stupid belt falling things, I guess it was like the, the work in this match was pretty darn good. 
Yeah, I mean, he was cool. It's unique. And it probably just blew people away a lot on concept alone. And Because, like, they didn't go absolutely nuts. You had a power bomb off the cables, which looked rad. You had Kazarian hitting Saban with a spear off the cables, which also looked really good. So you had a couple of, like, those really cool off-the-cables moves that kind of sell you on the concept. And again, while the belt did fall twice, which is very unfortunate. And Michael Shane, like, a huge gusher, giant blade job for this one. Like, I, I think the work of the wrestlers did sell the concept enough that people were like, oh, yeah, this is really cool and new and different. Yeah, I, I really want to give... Michael Shane some credit because I loved the finish of this match. Yeah. Where he just hold ass all the way down across it. Because yeah, Saban and Kazarian are, are climbing from separate sides and then Kazarian knocks off Saban. But then Shane just comes out of nowhere like a million miles an hour, grabs the belt, pulls it down. He's X Division champion. He has made history as the first ever winner of Ultimate X. And as he hits the ground, like immediately there's a pool of blood where he lands. Because mm. yeah, the, the giant blade job for this dude. And he sold it really well too, because like he's he looked like he was exhausted after he hit it. Mm. But yeah, I really good stuff. So Ultimate X, one of the still to this day like the signature match of both the X Division and Impact. We just had the first knockouts Ultimate X there earlier this month at Hard to Kill. It's still a match that people look forward to. It's a still a match that when it's announced, it's like oh hell yeah, and it's it's still a match that's pretty well protected because before the Ultimate X last year at Slammiversary. We'd actually went the longest period ever without an Ultimate X. So it was like over two years between Ultimate X matches. So it's not a match that they just throw out willy-nilly, even if we've had like one... We've had two in the last six months now. Hmm. There, there was only a, like a couple-year period where the Ultimate X lost its luster a little bit for me. Hmm. But now it's back, and it's like, if I see there's an Ultimate X, I want to check out an Ultimate X match. Yeah. So there's a fun note from Frankie Kazarian. This was in a, a feature originally published on ImpactWrestling.com. It's not available on the website anymore because I think it got nuked in like a redesign of the website. But it was a bunch of people. It was him, DJZ, Sanjay Dutt, PD Williams, uh, and some others reflecting. Christopher Daniels was another one reflecting on their experiences in Ultimate X. There was a very fun note from Frankie Kazarian about the very first one. So, quote from Kazarian. It was explained to me a couple of weeks beforehand by people in creative at TNA at the time. They'd created this new concept for a match. They said it was basically going to be poles surrounding the four sides of the ring and chains going across with the title in the middle. And they described it as a ladder match with no ladder. And being a fan of ladder matches and cool concepts in wrestling, I thought it was great. We were all flown in the night before to try out this structure and see what it was all about. By the time we got to the building, it hadn't even been constructed. The idea was basically steel poles inside the ring posts and stringing cables across from that. So like four poles either side of the ring. Like the Don, Don Cass does actually describe it as that the week before as well. He's like, it'll be four poles. So it was basically Ultimate X is an elaborate title on a pole match. Hmm. Back to Kazarian. They tried to do that. And when I went up there as a test, and this is the night before the actual pay-per-view, and the minute I got on the cable and started navigating my way across, all the poles just bent and collapsed into the ring. <laughs> and I was standing in the middle of the ring. So the ring crew workers are kind of shaking their heads and they were working on stuff all night and it started to get heated. People are giving advice and there were carpenters there who said they knew what they were doing but obviously didn't. So long story short, we really had no idea how it was going to come together and if it even was going to be a thing. So like literally the night before, the structure doesn't work. <laughs> Uh, it's very interesting that the original idea was the poles, but yeah, the weight distribution there just wouldn't work. <laughs> and the fact that it like collapsed in on itself with one person, never mind three. Yeah. I'm surprised they never like revisited the pole idea though. I, I guess well, like, they came up with the, the idea of doing steel lighting thrusts instead, which was more sturdy and it worked. So back mm. to Kazarian, we got to the building the next day and they decided to build the apparatus out of lighting trusses, having trusses outside the ring and splitting the cables across that. By the time they got it erected and everything, it was basically showtime. So we had no way to get up there and see if it was going to work or see how high it was. So we went into that first Ultimate X completely blind, just with just some ideas of what we thought could be done. So I'm very proud of that match and proud of the guys who were in it with me to be part of the first of anything in pro wrestling is very special and to be involved in the history of that match which has become so special is very cool and I wear it as a badge of honour. I think I might have been the first person who ever jumped up there and tried to get the belt. I remember jumping up there and the only training I had was the monkey bars at school so it was like well let's see how it works and as I started going across I saw the structure was in fact secure and not going to collapse on me. Imagine if it did. Just everything collapsed. Live on pay-per-view, Frankie Kazarian jumps up and the entire ultimate X structure that just caves in and everyone's like, well, shit. Yeah, they tried. <laughs> Which I guess that makes sense why they didn't really have time to like test whether or not the belt would fall because they barely had time to build the damn thing, never mind actually see what the belt hold in the middle. 
Mm. I found it interesting that at least they did try it out before, so I had to bring them out the night before. Mm. Oh, yeah, because imagine if they didn't, and it's like, like I haven't paid for you again. The four poles just like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that is the first Ultimate X match. We will be talking about many, many more in the future of this podcast. And then finishing out the X Division, last show of the month, NWA TNA pay view number 60, August 27th. Michael Shane had his first defense of the championship defending against Terry Lynn. And for the moment Liam has been waiting for, Michael Shane's promo before this match. Oh, d- um, so, you know, we, we go backstage, Terry Taylor is interviewing Michael Shane. Michael Shane, first of all, questions his credentials, mm-hmm. <laughs> asks him what he's ever done. Because, you know, Michael Shane, right? He is the showstopper. Oh. The main event. My God. The heartbreak kid. Sean Michaels' cousin. <laughs> and, like, from the beginning of this promo... You know exactly what he's doing. He has the glasses on. He has the swagger of a Shawn Michaels. He's chewing the gum so obnoxiously. Like, <laughs> everything that you would expect from a Shawn Michaels promo is here. Uh, yeah, they've completely embraced it now. It's complete parody at this point. And to be fair, that rules. Yeah, if you're going to make it a bit, just make it a bit. Don't do the, like, the Britt Baker is a dentist thing without leaning into it. And eventually they do lean into it. And it's like, yeah, it's fine. You made it a bit. Good job. Yeah. And it's a lot of fun. And of course, she, and the thing is, I wish he had have kept the glasses on during his entrance. <laughs> and done, like, the, the full Shawn Michaels dance. Yeah, should have gone on his knees and done the god thing. <laughs> and they should have set off, like, some pathetic pyro. Yeah. <laughs> Eat your heart out, girls. Hands off the merchandise. 100%. So, yeah, he defends the belt against Jerry Lynn in a fine match. A little disappointing, honestly, for the people in the ring. Yeah, and Jerry Lynn's, like, doing story stuff at the moment, so... Mm. Uh, Shane retains after the red shirt security distract Jerry Lynn. We'll talk more about Jerry Lynn and Don Cows in a moment. That, that's your X Division stuff of the month. The debut of Ultimate X. Oh, actually, no. I suppose we'll talk about the Super X Cup as well because they announced on this show that the the following episode will be the Super X Cup tournament, which will be a single elimination tournament featuring stars internationally and stars from the NWA TNA. The the brackets are Hoovy versus Nasawa, Johnny Storm versus Teddy Hart, Jerry Lynn versus Chris Sabin, and Michael Shane versus Frankie Kazarian. No sour wrong guy. Yeah. Noah's influence. It'd be seen here very early in TNA. These matches were actually taped this month. The first round matches were taped on the 20th and the semifinals and final were taped on the 27th. But we won't talk about results. That would be spoilers. For me, not even for the people listening. <laughs> yeah, Liam doesn't want the Super X Cup spoiling him. So that is the first show of September. They taped the Super X Cup plus the War Games match to air on that show. So that's the first broadcast. And then you have the one cent pay-per-view. So it's only a three-show month in September, Liam. You'll be very pleased. I am. <laughs> You've Got to Be Kidding Me is brought to you this week by HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm-fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. The new year is a great time to focus on what's most important to you. Whether it's saving money by ordering less takeout, learning to cook, or prioritizing your wellness, HelloFresh is here to help with endless options to make cooking at home simple and enjoyable. HelloFresh cuts back on time spent in the kitchen so you can spend it on your other resolutions with meals ready in around 30 minutes or less. Plus, quick and easy meals, including 20-minute recipes and low prep and easy cleanup options, provide an even faster route to putting food on the table. I know as I hit the new year, I'm one of those who makes many resolutions, many of which are hard to stick to, but HelloFresh makes eating healthy easy, affordable, and fast. Go to hellofresh.com slash VOW16 and use the code VOW16 for up to 16 free meals and 3 free gifts. That's hellofresh.com using the code VOW16. So that is the X Division for the month of August 2003. Where do you want to go next? Tag teams? I think we should do Jerry Lynn. Oh, okay, so Jerry Lynn feuds with Don Callis for most of the month. Yeah, I like this uh, feud a lot. So, NWA TNA number 57, Jerry Lynn arrives to the building and he is confronted by Don Callis, who is like, Jerry, you're just you're just too extreme. We we do not want the violent ways here in NWA TNA. We, we, we don't want the excessive violence. He's basically doing the WWE quote from the Toronto Star to Jerry Lynn. That's his character. Yeah. It's like, the excessive violence. No one wants it. So uh, you're suspended. Yeah, it's a good bit. And like, the heat here, of course, is that there's more violent things on these shows that are happening every week by other people. Yeah, because, and Jerry Lynn constantly points that out. It's like, well, there's a cage match in the main event between AJ and D'Lo, and Michael Shane is bleeding tons, and, like, Raven is thrown, has had fireballs thrown at him for a month. There's a clockwork orange match every two weeks. 
and yeah, but Jerry Lynn is the person that Don is like, oh, it's that's just excessive. Vi-. And uh, the other joke is that Jerry isn't really all that violent whatsoever in most of his matches. Yeah, like he had a a somewhat violent false count anyway match. Yeah, even like the because we go to NWTNA preview number fifty eight in which Jerry Lynn defeats Elix Skipper. Even the moment after this match where he hits Skipper with the scale again and starts attacking him. He's not even that violent there. Like, on the scale of TNA, where, like, somebody gets kidnapped. Uh, Jeff Jarrett is abducted on these shows, but Jerry Lynn's not even that violent. He does the hit with the thing, and it's like, okay, that's cool and all. There was a cage match the night before, you know that, right? <laughs> yeah, it was weird to see uh, Edith Skipper just, like, pinned unceremoniously in that match, wasn't it? Oh, he's a dork this month. He's just doing absolutely nothing. Because he did, we didn't even mention, he did run out for the four-way. He laid out Shark Boy, Joy Matthews, and... <laughs> I nearly said Joe Doring again because he changed the notes to <laughs> Joe Doring. Danny Doring, he laid them all out, which lets Shane win the match. And then Sharkboy had a little comeback and then Shane beat him. I like that run in by Skipper. Where it's like, oh, he's not in the exhibition match, so he's going to kill, kill everybody. That's a, ni- that's a nice little character touch. Mm. Yeah, but here he's, he's just losing to Jerry Lynn unceremoniously too. Like Jerry Lynn hits, admittedly, a sick looking draping DDT. Yeah. Like it puts Randy Orton's draping DDT to shame, but then he just pins him. <laughs> yeah, good finish. Yeah, so Jerry Lynn snaps, he starts grabbing Mike Posey, the referee, and Don Callis is, like, standing at the top of the ramp with a clipboard, taking notes, looking bemused. <laughs> that describes a lot of the Don Callis character. Next week, we have basically a repeat of the first segment of the month, where, where Callis is fining Jerry Lynn for attacking an official, and then the Red Security kick him out. The notable difference here is Jerry Lynn's facial hair. Yeah. <laughs> Jerry Lynn has decided, Liam, for reasons beyond comprehension... To dye his goatee. And now he kind of looks like a cartoon. He looks evil. He looks evil. He doesn't look like evil. It's like darkest timeline Jerry Lynn. He's like something out of community. Yeah, this is um Flashpoint Jerry Lynn. <laughs> he's not a nice man. But yeah, he's been ejected from the building again here. He should have done that when he was heel against AJ so we could actually tell. Mm. <laughs> he's like, he is like avid from community. He just slaps the facial hair on every time it's evil Jerry Lynn. I feel like we should, as we're talking about Jerry Lynn 2, give our, like, congratulations to him as he, uh, you know, was inducted into the Independent Wrestling Hall of Fame. He is an Independent Wrestling Hall of Famer. I I tweeted this last night, but you really can't overstate. We talked about this, I think, on our 2002 award show where I gave Jerry Lynn Wrestler of the Year. Where I was like, I will insist, like, those first six months, the most important wrestler in the company is Jerry Lynn. Because you have the likes of Loki and AJ who don't have national TV experience. And then you have everyone else in the company who is just, like, either a meme, a goof, a cartoon character, or a waster from a company that nobody wants. Or awful. Or awful. (laughs) There is the very bad category, too, yes. And Jerry is, like, the glue that holds all of that together for the first, like, six months of TNA. And... Without him, like, we talk about Daniels is probably, like, the biggest influence on making Styles the guy he is. But the second biggest influence is probably Jerry Lynn. Mm. 100%. So, yeah, it's nice to see him get his flowers. That's what I'm enjoying about this era in general. It feels like a lot of people who missed uh, Booms finally getting recognition for their work. Mm. Like, Jerry Lynn is influential in so many ways. Like, the Sean Waltman matches invented modern US cruiserweight wrestling, basically. And then the the Rob Van Dam matches reinvented it. And then probably the AJ matches reinvented it again. So, like, you have three years of Jerry Lynn, like, taking what is considered cruiserweight wrestling in the United States and putting a different spin on it. Yeah. Later in that show, there is a a segment where the red shirts come out to try and break up a brawl, but Lynn runs out and runs them off. We'll talk about what the brawl is when we get to a different segment. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then last show of the month, as we mentioned, Jerry Lynn gets his X Division Championship match against Michael Shane. I did quite enjoy that Don Callis was very upset at this development. Yeah, he's like, what has he done? (laughs) And like, Mike Tanay rightly points out, he's like, he beat like Justin Incredible like four times. He beat Elix Skipper three times in a row. He deserves a title match. And Don is like, well, well, shut up. But he's like, but he's violent. He's a mean, angry man. Mike Tanay does actually use the line Pioneer of the X Division, which I think is for the first time to say that about Jerry Lynn, which goes on to become his like nickname. He's the Pioneer of the X Division, Jerry Lynn. Yeah. Very exciting. And this match also did have the debut of the classic Michael Shane music, which would go on to become the Bentley Bounce music, Liam, so there's foreshadowing. Yes, excited to do the Bentley Bounce. Yeah. 
So, yeah, Jerry Lynn has the match against Michael Shane. Don Callis is on concrete talking about how terrible and horrible and violent Jerry Lynn is. Red shirts come out, distract him, Shane retains. Yeah, so Callis ends up leaving because he's so disgusted at what's happening. And he uh, calls out the red shirt security and it ends up costing Jerry Lynn. And then maniacal laugh, maniacal laugh. <laughs> so that feud will continue into September. Exciting. Let's move over to tag teams, in which there is only one tag team feud for the entire month, and that is the feud between America's Most Wanted and Johnny Swinger and Simon Diamond. A sentence we have said many a time. There's only one tag team feud this month, and it involves America's Most Wanted. Yeah, so they have a match on basically, not even basically, they do have a match on every single one of these shows. They have a rawhide strap match, they have a six-man tag, they have a Texas bull rope match, and then they have a regular tag team title match. So literally every single one of these shows features... (laughs) That's how uh, shows escalate, you know? Well, yeah, you go from singles match, which they had last month, to strap match, to six-man tag, to bull rope match, to singles match. Yeah, you just go back down to a, a regular tag at the end. So, NW Teenage Baby number 57, the rawhide strap match between AMW and Diamond Swinger, their best match of this month. This match absolutely rocked. Yeah, these two, these four, have like random stupid uh, chemistry together. And like the crowd are super into AMW at this stage, except for the one guy in the crowd that had like America's Most Worthless sign. The big piece of <laughs> shit. It's not even wordplay, you just used a different W word. I believe that is what passes as wordplay. No, it doesn't. It's disgusting behavior. Try harder. So this is the match of the month, right? I would say it's AJ and Raven, but it's close. I gave both of them the same rating, but I think I would narrowly edge AJ Raven. You would narrowly be wrong. (laughs) But yeah, this match absolutely rocked. Asylum was going nuts. There was actually a note in the Observer that basically they shouldn't have started with this match because nobody could follow them. (laughs) Well, to be fair, I don't think they expected it, you know? Mm-hmm. But yeah, this rocked. I really loved these guys together, and we're gonna. Things are like we're not gonna break this down because it's the same thing you saw last month. It's the same thing you saw every other show in this month. But it was just good. Yeah, I love the the formula these guys do, which is they do the cheap finish. They do like the belt shot referee distraction, and every time it's like, oh, it's the lazy cheap finish. But then Chris Harris kicks out, and then it's like yeah. they come back again and they do like another Glenn Gilberty interference spot, and it's like, oh, it's the cheap finisher. It's like, oh no, this time James Storm kicks out, and it keeps going, and it's so good. Yeah, this is I like it a lot, and isn't that like exact perfect America's Most Wanted psychology though? Mm. That's just that's what they do all the time. They know how to like subvert expectations, and I think it works especially in a company like NWA TNA, which is like rampant with these shitty finishes. That they literally take these finishes and they turn them on their head and not, and they do something that you don't expect. They turn them into great false finishes. Yeah, and then they pay them off in the end when it actually works. Must be noted this is a non-title match in which JP once again said reigning and defending. Ah, this guy. Also, more importantly, this match featured the debut, Liam, of the America's Most Wanted theme. It sure is the theme. It is the iconic AMW theme with the We Find the Defendants Guilty. They're no longer coming out to the theme song, which I think you kind of hated. I mean, I just I don't love this one either, but it's fine. Why don't you don't love the AMW theme? It's alright. I don't think I've ever thought about it for more than two seconds. Chris, I do like the we find the defendants guilty bit. That's a cool stinger. Where do you think Chris Harris's spear ranks in the like pantheon of spears? See, the problem with it is it varies. Because mm. like very occasionally he'll hit it and it will be the edge hugging the fall down spear. Mm. But then other times he'll hit like full on Roman speed with it. When you just like cut somebody in half. Yeah, when he gets it good, it's like up there with the best. But he does have a tendency to sometimes just fall with it. So after this match, AMW won the non-title match with Diamond and Swinger, jumped them after the bell, and stole the belts. Ah, your favorite. They also had a, a brawl later in the show where AMW brawled with Diamond and Swinger but got whipped three on two after Gilberti ran out with some straps. Mm-hmm. And we also had maybe my favorite segment of the month on this show. Ooh. <laughs> where there is a new thing they do while Mike Tanay and Don West are running down the card for the next week's show. They routinely now have someone else come out and make a challenge for another match on the next week's show. So AMW come out and they're like, we're going to challenge you to a six-man tag and our partner is going to be on the phone right now. (laughs) And they cut to Dusty on the phone and Dusty does like a full two-minute promo where they like you could tell they expected, I don't know, was like Dusty actually live or was there like miscommunication about this voice recording or something? Maybe he was actually live, but it sounded like they expected him to be like, oh, it's me, daddy, I'll see you next week. But Dusty goes on for like two minutes and Mike Tanay and Don West are just like nodding and like, hell yeah, Dusty. And he keeps on going and he keeps on going. And they're like, yeah, Dusty, good job. 
I like to imagine Dusty was just like in his kitchen, mm. just on the phone, talking his shit. He's like, oh, AMW, I told them the best tag team of this generation. They're like kids to me. So, of course, I'd show up and help them, daddy. Yeah. So, Dusty Rhodes aligning himself with AMW for NWAT and APV number 58, in which we have a six-man tag team match, which is Diamond Swinger and Glenn Gilberti against America's Most Wanted and the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes, in a match that I absolutely adored. Yeah, this is fun. Dusty was great in this. Because, shocker, Liam, this Dusty Rhodes character is a real big star. What? So, every time he gets in the ring... He does absolutely nothing. Like, there's a moment in this match where he gets in the ring, he teases an elbow to Gilberti move, who moves, he hits Swinger with an elbow, and then teases one on the diamond who moves. And, like, the asylum just goes ape shit. They lose their <laughs> minds at Dusty doing one move. And you see a lot of that um, transfer over to the net match on the next week's show as well, where literally nothing happens, but I adored it. <laughs> it's just Dusty kicking ass, doing cool shit. Yeah. Dusty and AMW win. After the match, Daniels attacks Dusty. Jarrett say we'll get into all that later. But the, the crux is that we have two matches set up for the following week. A Texas Bull Rope match between AMW and Diamond and Swinger. And a... No, wait. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it's a Texas Bull Rope match for the following week. And then we have another Texas Bull Rope match for the last show of the month. We'll get into that. I, I lost my sequence of events, Liam. So did I, because I said the, one, the match I was referring to was in the last show of the month. Because there is Diamond Swinger matches on every single show. NWA TNA pay-per-view number 59. There is another Diamond and Swinger match against AMW, and this one is the Texas Bull Rope match. This is my least favorite of the bunch. At least memorable, perhaps. Well, that, that's the problem with the first one being the best. Like, all of these matches are good. Like, all of them are very enjoyable tag team matches, but the the best one is, like, so far and away, even though you give this three and a half stars, by the way, and you give the last one three stars, so there you go. Well, no, I gave it 3.75. No, this one, the Texas Bull Rope, you gave three and a half. Yeah, but I'm saying I gave the first one 3.75. But you said this is the least memorable of the month, but the next one you only get three stars to. Yeah, but there was a title change. More memorable. <laughs> but yeah, good match. Same old... Don't fucking question me. <laughs> Half the people in this thing don't even read the... The star ratings, they would, not, they would not have known. If you would like to look at Liam's star ratings to hold him accountable for such decisions, you can go to tnhad.com, it's on the $1 tier on Patreon. And I stand by my statement, there's a title change. More memorable. But yeah, uh, it's another very good Diamond and Swinger match, it's another very good AMW match, it's it's good stuff, it's enjoyable. It's the one we did for the watch along as well, so there there's that for you. Diamond and Swinger won, but then still jumped AMW after the match, but Diamond and Swinger here winning is what earned them a tag title match on the last show of the month. Neat. So, last show of the month, AMW, Diamond and Swinger, for the fourth time, if you include the six-man tag. <laughs> this one, tag title change, Diamond and Swinger are your new tag team champions after Klingel Birdie interfered. I was happy with this. I like this team a lot, and I'm glad that they won the tag belts. I don't think they'll have, like, this gigantic run with them, but they were. it's a good uh, good little title change. And later in the show, Johnny Swinger does a little promo backstage, and I find it so strange to hear him, like, he still sounds like the current-day Johnny Swinger. So he's like, aha, swingman daddy, we won the tag titles. It's like, there's like a cognitive dissonance between what I'm seeing on the screen and hearing in his voice. It's like, he's not the character, but he still sounds like the character, but he's not the character and my brain can't handle it. If he was the character, he would be the biggest star in the, in the company. <laughs> so yeah, Diamond and Swinger are your tag champs. There was a Tower of Doom spot, a giant like stacked suplex where James Storm got a concussion. So when you see that spot in this match, that's where he got the concussion. So when he was getting um, helped out, that was legitimate. <laughs> Mm. And yeah, he doesn't appear for the the angle at the end of the show that sets up the war games either, so... Got rocked. Even though he still wrestles in the war games. Don't do that, guys, mm. folks. Don't, don't. Don't wrestle with concussions. Don't. Especially since it was filmed at, like, the same show. Yeah. After the match, Dusty is pissed. He comes out and he says, one of my favorite lines in TNA history, that's about some unadulterated bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think may be episode opening worthy. Oh, definitely for this episode, for sure. Mm. May even include the, the Michael Shane, a heartbreak kid, Shawn Michaels' cousin quote. We might as well just chuck, yeah, we might as well chuck that in when we're talking about it. Give the people what they want. Yeah, it's like a falcon arrow. You've got to give them. That's the hug. <laughs> That's the do the deal, yeah. I'm mixing up Excalibur catchphrases. Chow bacon, hello. <laughs> so that led us straight into a bull rope match between Dusty Rhodes and Glen Gilberti, which was, as mentioned, it's carried entirely by the charisma of the American dream. Yeah, but I loved it. Yeah. It's just Dusty. It's just Dusty. Dusty is so badly missed on these shows, and I'm so happy he's back. Yeah, I hope he wins the world title. Mm. So, yeah, Dusty lost after Daniels interfered again to cost Dusty the match. <laughs> we just pushed him in the back, and Dusty died. <laughs> Listen, if if you were attacked from behind and do not see it coming, it can be very devastating. It, obviously it was. 
Diamond Swinger ran out, AMW ran out, Jarrett made the ultimate save. We'll talk again, we'll talk about all that when we get to different stories, but Gilberti picks up a victory over Dusty Rhodes. That's um when you put in the resume. Let's bounce over to the only other tag team stuff that's really here this month. It's the only tag team adjacent to. That's three live crew Liam. It's the remix. They don't have that theme song yet, please refrain. I know I'm de- I'm devastated that they don't have that theme. End of the TNA Baby number 57, we see 3LK visit the trailer park, Liam. This was the worst of the vignettes. Honestly, I thought it was on par with all the other ones in that it wasn't very good. I thought this one wasn't good, and I liked the others, so... So yeah, they, they go there, everyone's a creep, everyone's kind of weird. BG was hand fishing, he was trying to catch fish with his hand. <laughs> I did enjoy him just in the creek. Uh, I also noticed, like, BG James is not regularly shirtless, but he does have dog tattooed on his chest. Yes. Like, in the region of his belly button, he just has D O double G tattooed, which I'm pretty sure WWE might have tried to illegally remove. From his body? Yeah, it's like, that's our trademark. Get it off your body on television. No. Get BG tattooed on, the, or a single, or single G dog. Get James Gang tattooed over it. Like the WWA, he has to get the dog with a single G tattooed, so he has to get a G removed. <laughs> no, he has to get, a, it's a bigger tattoo, but it's just the word dog. <laughs> No, he should have had to get three live crew. Uh, I did quite enjoy there was a total knockoff of Sweet Home Alabama playing over this segment. Yes. Very silly. It wasn't even a parody at one stage. It's like, no, that's just, that's just still just Sweet Home Alabama. That's not even a copy of it. So, forgive me here, mm-hmm. but there's a point where Conan walks away and then goes, Wow, Ron, you need to see this, right? Mm-hmm. And then they go over there. And they don't show us what it is? We'll never know. It was too extreme. The trailer park is just too extreme for us to find out. Okay, so I'm not crazy. (laughs) They just didn't reveal that. It's just the general trailer park. Okay. (laughs) But yeah, nothing happened in this one. That's what made this one the worst. There wasn't even jokes. It was just like, this guy is creepy. Yeah. And then, yeah, Ron Killings murdered a pervert. That's about it. The pervert deserved it. Yeah, he was like jerking off. Can't be doing that in public. No. And then we had two 3LK matches, Liam. The first of which is like the most bizarre collection of human beings known to man. And we had TNA Baby number 58. That show opened with Ron Killings, BG James and Conan against Sin, the Vampire Warrior, better known as Gangrel, and Devin Storm, better known as Crowbar. All of these members should have joined the new church. Well, we'll talk about the new church. We did have one of these people joining the new church this month. Which is something that um, I think Don West mentioned on commentary. That... These three guys kind of look like the new church. Conan did his intro stick where he's like, where are my dogs at? Or are they Viva Rasa? All that stuff. And it's very funny to see like <laughs> some of the whitest people in the world repeating Conan's catchphrases. Yeah, me. Just like that asylum crowd is incredibly white. So it's very amusing to see them repeating Conan, Conan's catchphrases back to him. Just, yeah, so cool. Kind of has the coolest. It's interesting. They eventually do the thing where they do all of like their catchphrases, where it's like Conan does his his trademark catchphrases and BG does his trademark catchphrases, but not yet. And Ron does his trademark. Yeah, he just shouts "What's up" at the end. <laughs> What's up? I I do find it fascinating. Like Conan has done the exact same promo every week on multiple different shows for multiple different companies, and he's nearly always like the like top five most popular guy in the show. So does BG James, just not to the same popularity extent. Like, they're not good wrestlers. They don't have good matches. They just do the same promo and people absolutely love them. People just want to hear the promo, man. People just want to hit the lines. People just want to shout in unison. And the fact that most wrestlers don't Mm -hmm. have catchphrases these days tells you that they don't get the business. Because, like, Mark Henry Liam has gotten over it's time for the main event. (laughs) It's time for the main event. And if he can get that over, you can get anything over. Garrett... There's been enough talk about this match. <laughs> so yes, that will take us to the last 3LK match of the month, which is NWTNA Fabian number 60, which was 3LK against the New Church. We went to a no contest for an angle. We will talk about more when we're talking about Raven against Shane Douglas. Mm-hmm. I liked both of these 3LK matches. They're nothing special, but they're like good high energy openers that aren't like, they don't overstay their welcome. They're both about five, six minutes. They're just guys doing their moves. No, no, no like prolonged heat segment. Nobody trying to actually wrestle. It's just guys hitting their high spots and getting in and out. Yeah, this has been an enjoyable month for BG James. Congratulations, BG. You did it. <laughs> the big baby face third nobody expected. Liam and BG James. Mm. 
just never work a singles match ever and we'll be fine. And last show of the month, Thrill Care doing a promo backstage that is interrupted by Disco Diamond and Swinger. Jared hits Disco with the guitar, but I believe that's to suggest that our next tag team program is in fact Diamond and Swinger against the Three Live crew. Yeah, and they um they call them gay. Ah yes. Isn't that funny, Liam? <laughs> Let's go to Raven and Douglas, because I think that's better than most of the other stuff this month. Yeah, it's the best angle the entire show. For the second month in a row, it's the best angle in the entire show. This is a good angle. Yeah, they, they're kind of killing it. Mm. And like, this is some, like, you know, this is some pro wrestling us pro wrestling here. Have a real good feud that leads into a Raven title match, and then the Raven title match is super fucking over. Yeah, so, first show of the month, NWTNA, paper number 57. Shane Douglas is bragging about pinning Raven in the six-man tag Clockwork Orange match that ended last month. Raven shows up with a body bag. He wants to put Douglas in the body bag, but James Mitchell has trapped... Put him in a body bag! There you go. He has trapped Julio De Niro and Alexis Lurie in some kind of truck backstage with the new church. They have a flaming stick. It looks dangerous. I was very worried for, like, both of these people have long hair. And I was worried that it was going to catch. Everyone in that room had long hair except for Slash. Yeah, Slash is smart. He's like, I'm not going to have hair here. I'm not catching fire with this flaming kendo stick. But it was close and it was scary. Yeah, that backstage vignette was filmed in some kind of truck, probably due to the the fire marshal restrictions that they can't actually have fire in the building. Cowards. (laughs) So the the whole thing here is that James Mitchell is like, do you care about these people enough or do you want to just get revenge on Shane Douglas? So he has to choose in this moment, Liam. Is he going to go after the gathering and save them or is he going to continue attacking Shane Douglas? Because he was saying that the old Raven would have just taken the opportunity to beat the shit out of Shane Douglas. Whereas the new Raven, Liam, he chooses the gathering. Chooses his friends. He goes to help his pals and leaves his vengeance on Shane Douglas for another day. So it's character growth. Mm. It's almost like he's getting positioned to be the biggest baby face in the company. Mm. Later in the show, Raven gets to the room where they were kidnapped. They're gone. They turn out to be in the ring. Mitchell and the new church are there. <laughs> Raven takes out Slash. He takes out Brian Lee, but dropped by Douglas and then put in the body bag. They should have written off Alexis Lurie early here and just had like a pile of ash on her seat. <laughs> She's literally burned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She was just turned into ash. <laughs> uh... There's no viscous. There's no gore. It's just ash. So, end of your teenage baby number 58, we have the big Raven and Shane Douglas match, which I thought, good match. Yeah. Not, like, good from a wrestling perspective, because there's some moments that were really bad from a wrestling perspective. But they're both over. <laughs> yeah, because there was a, a period during Raven's comeback where he hit a series of clotheslines. He hit, like, three, and then he was going for a fourth, and Shane Douglas was painfully slow to get up. Then they basically missed the clothesline, and then he fell over, and the crowd booed. And it's like, oh... <laughs> And there's also some points where it's like, there was some big setup moves and they were like, you know, it was slow to get into it, but, you know, for the, who cares? It's Raven and Shane Douglas. Yeah, I thought it was a good angle. Shane Douglas is a very good heel. He knows how to work like a small building. He's like that kind of heel who knows how to like really amp his facial expressions up and his mannerisms. We'll talk about that more, I think, in the Gauntlet match in which I thought he was tremendous. But yeah, this match, they try to do the same thing again where it's like they bring Alexis Lurie trapped inside a body bag and James Mitchell is like, she's about to run out of oxygen. She has maybe 10 seconds worth of oxygen to which I quite enjoy the crowd. Ten, <laughs> nine, hey, Raven's like, ah, I can't get it open. <laughs> the crowd started chanting and counting down to like Alexis Lurie's imminent demise. And also like the idea exactly at one, she'd die. Yeah, so Raven again has to decide, but this time he's smart. He actually rolls up Shane Douglas, he snatches a win, and then goes to save Alexis Lurie. Raven should have opened it up and then there was Ash in the body bag. Ah, and she's dead. Yes. As it turns out, it was not Alexis Lurie inside the body bag, but the <gasps> mysterious man. So the white arm comes out, grabs him, chokes him, and just as Shane Douglas is about to start cutting Raven's hair, security intervenes. Damn, security. Uh, a note, Raven is open to the idea of having his head shaved as part of his an upcoming hair versus hair match storyline. This is where, obviously, the scissors are introduced here to start building to that hair versus hair match. He pitched the idea to Tina officials several weeks ago, but the company did not agree to pay him the money he wanted to perform the angle. Raven took the idea to Ring of Honor, which quickly issued a press release to announce a Raven versus CM Punk hair versus hair match. By week's end, ORH called off that match and used the excuse that the match could not take place due to Raven's contractual obligations to TNA. So, my favourite backstage thing about this was apparently Jarrett calling Raven and being like, if you get your hair shaved in Ring of Honor, you will not be on this show until your hair grows out to the same length again. 
I quite enjoy it as like a, a sly political move from Raven. It's like, if you're not going to pay me, I'm going to go to Ring of Honor and do it. Which then makes them go, no, 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 we'll do it, we'll do it, we'll do it. We'll do it. <laughs> but apparently, gigantic pay cut to do it in, in Impact. Yeah, that's what you get, Raven. You've signed the contract. This is your problem. Raven is regretting signing that TNA deal now. Yeah, that merchandising deal. So yeah, this is the build to a hair versus hair match. August 20th, NWA TNA Baby number 59 opens with the gathering of the New Church brawling. Lights go out. The mystery man has hung Raven from the ropes. Yeah, really, like, violent. <laughs> yeah, and, like, that noose was tied tight. That man was being legitimately choked. Yeah. So, yeah, Raven was being hung and dangled there, but the gathering made the save just as Shane Douglas was again trying to cut some of Raven's hair. Punk's back. Yeah, Punk is back with the gathering. That's a, that's an important point to note. It's also, we, we didn't even mention it the week before, it's no longer... Brian Lee. Yes, we have a new member. We have Sin is the new member of the Disciples of the New Church, and that is because Brian Lee no-showed at the, the previous week's event. So Brian Lee has... He's gone and he's never coming back. Of course we talked about uh, what was going on there on the last show. Mm. Brian Lee no-showed Wednesday's NWA TNA pay review. He was scheduled a team with Slash in a match against Julio De Niro and CM Punk. Sin ended up being put in that match instead. The general feeling backstage that he was replaced in the Disciples of the New Church tag team. Lee was replaced in the match by Sin, who debuted in the August 20th show in the opening six-man tag match. Sin is the latest TNA wrestler who was recommended by backstage agent Scott Demore, who promotes Porter City Wrestling. Sin and his girlfriend Tracy Brooks, Kazarian stole Tracy Brooks from Sin, clearly, who, work, <laughs> who works for TNA as a woman in a, in a schoolgirl outfit, recently moved from Canada to Nashville in hopes of finding regular work from TNA. I think she's more than just a woman in a schoolgirl outfit. <laughs> To be fair, in TNA programming, that is basically the description of who she is. No, she was. She had like a whole, you know, women against the men story. She had multiple stories. She had layers, PW Torch. You give her her layers. Yeah. Shut up, PW Torch. Jesus. At this point, the speculation is that Sin will be the permanent replacement for Lee, who appears to be on his way out of TNA. Even though he has numerous friends in the office, they may bring him back if he cleans up his act, but he never came back. Mm-hmm. This is the end of Brian Lee's run in TNA. A very good run, and it's a shame it ends like this. Yeah, like we said, I think we kind of did the whole talk about his uh, run last time, but Disciples of the New Church are a great underrated tag team. Mm. So the story of the show is that Raven has been taken out because of that hanging. He's been taken to hospital. He's not fit to perform in the main event gauntlet match. And the Disciples of the New Church face a Punk and Julio later in the show, who Raven's not there, which allows Alexis to re- have her hair cut by Shane Douglas. Mm-hmm. In the most like polite way he possibly could. <laughs> yeah, what a nice guy. Only doing the dead end. Basically, just got her a free haircut. Yeah, and especially because I'm not sure when she signed the OBW deal, but I'd imagine she knew doing this angle she was on the way out. She's she like, you can take the smallest amount off of my hair, but not that much. Yeah, uh, I will not be changing my look drastically before I go to developmental. So yeah, Shane Douglas very politely cut just enough of her hair so that it was impactful, but not so much to uh, change her appearance in any way whatsoever. 100%. Then the main event of that show is a gauntlet match where the whole idea is that Raven's not meant to be there because he was beaten up by the New Church at the start of the show. Jarrett's not going to be there for reasons we'll talk about in a moment. He was kidnapped. So it's a gauntlet to determine the number one contender. It has Kid Cash, Ron Killings, Christopher Daniels, BG James, Sonny Siaki. Jeff Jarrett's music plays, but he's not there. Again, abducted. Dila Brown, Mad Mikey, who came out but wasn't in the match, but was very mad he wasn't in the match. But he he tried. And his name's Mad Mikey, and he's mad. Abyss, Sandman, Legend, Conan, the franchise, and eventually Raven. But we'll get to that in a moment. Unlike the last Gauntlet match, I thought this one rocked. We were talking a lot about how like the, the recent Gauntlet matches they did had like no stories and no ideas and no like reoccurring things running through them. Whereas this one did. It obviously had the hook that were like, were Jarrett or Raven going to show up? Because Raven was uh, injured, Jarrett was kidnapped. There was the reoccurring theme that Abyss was like the, the dominant badass k- killing everybody, throwing everybody over the top rope. Yeah, the Kid Cash story there, too. Yeah, because Abyss then eliminated Kid Cash, who is his tag team partner and master. I was going to say master. <laughs> it's, who is his dom? He is his dom. Uh, Conan was like the biggest star in the match. Got an insane pop. As always. And then last person to come out, Raven, bloodied, battered, bruised, comes out, not letting this opportunity get away from him. He eliminates a bunch of people. It comes down to Raven and franchise. Shane Douglas does like the best cowering heel routine. He's so good. 
I was going to say, I think I like this like mini match at the end of this gauntlet more than their actual match. Yeah, because they get straight to it. Like Shane Douglas is making all the faces in the world that's like, oh no, Raven's here. No, we took him out. No, but he's here. And then he, he does the thing where he like psychs himself up. He's like, no, I'm Shane Douglas. I'm going to go get him. And then he immediately gets his ass kicked by Raven. He gets quickly DDT'd. And Raven is your number one contender for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. Woo! I like this gauntlet match a lot. I thought they told him some good stories and the, the closing angle was real good. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. And then, last show of the month, we open with 3LK against the New Church, which ends when James Mitchell tries to interfere to attack Ron Killings before the gathering, even the odds. Yeah. And then our main event, Raven. Actually, no, there's a Raven promo in the middle of the show, which I thought was really good, where he's he's sitting down with Mike Tanay, and Mike, he's talking about how, you know, there was the Tommy Rich and Buzz Sawyer feud that he watched. Both guys, you know, they were on the path to greatness, but they got sidetracked with blood feuds. And he talks about his own yeah. ECW history, where he's like, I was on the path to greatness. I was world champion, but then I got sidetracked by Dreamer and our hate feud and blood feud. And then Sandman and our personal vendetta against each other. And I never got back to the world championship. And he's like, here in, in TNA, I promised that wouldn't happen. I promised this is the time where I'd get back to the world championship. But then Shane Douglas comes around and he's, he's trying to drag me back into one of these blood feuds and I'm not going to let it happen. Yeah, that's awesome. Raven with good material, Liam. Who would have known? Who would have thunk it? He's a good promo. It's just like Raven with um, direction. Mm. One of the best. And that brings us to our main event for the World Championship. Raven versus AJ Styles. Tremendous match. I like this match a ton. The match itself, I didn't, was whatever. Like, it had some really cool spots. It was um, well structured. But to me, like... The thing that really put this over the edge was just the atmosphere. For a company that you don't consider to be like a big match company, this, especially at this point, their big NWA title matches feel like such gigantic matches. The atmosphere, the, like people living and dying by everything that happens on these shows. It's just, you can you really felt it. You, you felt it during Raven and Jarrett. You felt it during Killings and Jarrett. You felt it during um, Styles and Jarrett. Oh, hmm. <laughs> I was going to say, wait a minute. There's a lot of Jarrett stuff. But yeah, you felt it here too. Like, this felt like a gigantic deal. And this crowd wanted Raven to win so badly. Yeah. Because, like, there's a, a, an interference spot here where Slash comes out with a bunch of powder. Raven kicks the powder into his face. Slash doesn't know who he's hitting, so he hits the, the Worthy Bird, the Eye of the Storm, on Styles instead of Raven. Raven pins Styles crowd are like one two styles kicks out and like every set of hands in the asylum like flies in the air like oh like in unison you see the limbs go flying some people thought like he did win some people were devastated that he didn't it's legitimately it's, it might be like a top 10 near fall in tna history yeah but yeah the, the crowd's so into this they wanted Raven to win. You had a bunch of interference. You had the new church coming out, the gathering, cut them off. And eventually Shane Douglas comes out, hits a low blow, allowing Styles to hit the Styles Clash and retain the NWA World Championship. And as I said, this is probably my match of the month. I thought this match rocked, mostly because the crowd were just going absolutely apeshit for it. Crowds, huh? Mmm. Best thing should happen. It's fun when you can get people in your audience that care about the stories you're telling. More people should try that. And it is such a contrast to, like, Jarrett never felt like this as a baby face. Whereas Raven does. No. Raven feels like a legitimate top baby face. People can relate to Raven a lot more. Mm. Let's go to... There's a bunch of intersecting feuds that build toward war games. So let's start with AJ's world title defenses, I guess. This is the war games portion. Indeed. As we build to Wednesday, Bloody Wednesday. First show of the month. NWAT and pay number 57, August 6th. AJ defended the world championship against Deal Brown in a steel cage match. Uh, I... Yeah. <laughs> Uh, deeply, yeah? deeply, deeply disappointing for me, honestly. Yeah, uh, uh, there's just too much going on here. Yeah, it's just, it was all about Watts and Russo at ringside. The finish was D'Lo got up to the top of the cage, which I think is the third time D'Lo has climbed to the top of the cage. Without... He's a crazy person. And he hasn't been able to hit a single move off the top, though. They keep cutting him off. Poor D'Lo can't do his frog slash off the cage. Hmm. Uh, me like Tifa, would you want to take that? <laughs> uh, well, yeah. So the finish is Watts picks Russo up while Russo's trying to defear. He rams Russo into the cage, but while Dilo's on top of the cage, Dilo falls off because the cage moves, and AJ retains. That's a crazy finish. Yeah, and it makes sense, and it protects Dilo, but it's just... The match wasn't good enough for me to put up with a bad finish, you know? And also, like, five minutes of it was... Let's put the cameras on Watts beating up Russo on the outside. Mm. And yeah, the, the, the AJ Delo feud as a world title program, I think, falls broadly into the disappointing category. I think the best match they had 
was the match where AJ became number one contender, which was before they even started feuding. They were still tag team partners at that stage. Yeah, and I was going to say, like, their best matches were their tag matches, too. Mm. So, yeah, it's, it's quite unfortunate. That, like, And I don't think it's really their fault. I think it's just, like, everything around them is about that instead of about their world title program. It's all about Russo and Siaki and, and Watts. It's not about AJ and D'Lo. Yeah. There was, like, an age of stalling before this match. Like, the, the second last match on this show was... What was it? Was it AMW against Diamond Swinger or Saban against Kaz? Either way. Kaz Saban. And, like, the gap between Saban and Kaz and the start of AJ and D'Lo, they had, like, a Daniel segment. They had, like, the AMW segment with uh, announcing Dusty as their partner. They had a video package for Styles and D'Lo. They had an interview with Styles and Russo. They had an interview with D'Lo. It was, like, 30 minutes without wrestling. It's like, ne- up next, it's the world title match. Now let us stall for a significant portion of time. You should have just let them go for 30. Yeah, so there was a sit-down interview with Styles and Russo where Styles was like, oh, you know, I'm I'm with Russo just because. And he tried to explain it, but he didn't actually have a reason. He just said, why not? Yeah. I mean, he has the power. AJ wearing, like, baggy jeans and a t-shirt. Tis the, t'was the, the look of the time. I did quite enjoy that, like, Russo's like, AJ, get out of here. And then Russo tries to get in Mike Tanae's face. It's like, say it to my face, Mike. And like, Mike Tanae's like, yes, I will. I have been. You suck. Go away. Leave me alone. <laughs> Don't threaten me. Yeah, he's like, Russo tries to be all like threatening and intim- intimidating and Mike Tanae, and he like puts his hand on his throat and Mike Tanae just knocks his hand off his throat and is like, shut the fuck up, you stupid idiot. Also, that was so real. Mm. Like, Mike was like, don't fucking touch me. Yeah, Mike Tanae is the biggest badass on these shows. He's not scared. So NWA TNA pay number 58 Eric Watts comes to the ring. Hell yeah. Your favorite wrestler. He's up there. So he's talking about how he's going to lay down the authority and he's going to make a title match for tonight. But then Styles and Russo come out and it's like, we're going on vacation, buddy. <laughs> and they do. AJ Styles' fashion choices here were like even worse. He was looked like a 21 Jump Street style person trying to infiltrate a college <laughs> frat as a police officer. Yeah. He looked like a 25 year old who keeps failing Sunday school. <laughs> 25 year olds go to Sunday school? But, like, the point is, he kept on failing, so he's just still there. Ah. <laughs> uh, do they hold people back at Sunday school? You haven't learned God well enough, Liam. You have to stay in Sunday school. I've only been to Sunday school, like, twice. <laughs> Clearly, they didn't get you to stay there. You were like, oh, I'll have to be years here. They said, you've completed Jesus. Russo and Stiles were trying to back away. I quite enjoyed Russo. Where he got in, like, Eric Watt's face and was like, look at me when I'm talking to you. But as he said that, he, like, stepped in behind Stiles, which I thought was a nice little character touch. He's good at that kind of Weasley shit. Eric Watts replied, you can take your little chicken. Stopped, because he didn't want to curse. Looked at the crowd. The crowd chanted, shit. And then Watts was like, thank you. He's like, thank you. I couldn't say it. <laughs> Chicken stuff. So the crux of this segment is that Russo and Styles start to walk away, but then Watts goads AJ into accepting a world championship match against the returning Loki. Yeah. Um, who we are just, we're not acknowledging the sex stuff with. Not at all. Last we saw of Loki, Liam, he was a member of Vince Russo's Sports Entertainment Extreme, and now he is just a baby face. <laughs> yep. Sure. And he cuts the same, like, Loki warrior promo as he was doing when they, he first showed up. Yeah, so he's just back to being OG babyface Loki. I am a warrior man. I am going to fight you in my deep Loki voice. It's pretty good. Thank you. Main event of the show, AJ Styles against Loki in their final singles match in TNA. Wow. It's fine. I, yeah, I thought it was a, a very good world title match, but not great. I preferred the Raven match. And it's wild that AJ and Raven had a better match than AJ and Loki did. You gave it the same rating. I didn't. I was like 3.5, didn't I? 3.75. Well, I'm wrong, aren't I? (laughs) How dare you hold my ratings accountable. Nice to be held accountable (laughs) for your ratings, huh? Monster. How dare you do this to me again? But yeah, I thought it was a very good match. I thought they worked well together. I quite enjoyed toward the end of the match when Loki got got Russo on like the announce table and started beating the shit out of him. Mike Tanay was never so happy. And he, like, pounced him, too. Yeah, Mike today very much cheering on Loki's beating up a Russo. There was, like, a, an exchange of strikes that a Styles did, where he did, like, a bunch of punches, chops, and kicks that reminded me a lot of, like, a less polished version of the same thing he'd do in, like, 2013, 2014, where he'd do, like, the leg kick, the punch, the leg kick, and then, like, the spinning back fist. Yeah, the slap, slap, leg kick, back fist. Yeah, which would be, like, a, a signature Styles exchange, but it felt like a much less polished, like desperate flurry here but it did remind me of that thing so he's like oh look at him sorry to, to clarify slap slap leg kick back kick and zaguri because that's the the, the finishes of that sequence mm. 
So, yeah, Russo interferes. AJ hits Loki with a baseball bat, retains the title. Very good match. I thought that, like, other than the D'Lo match, I liked both AJ title defenses this month. I thought he had a good match against Loki and a good match against Raven. The problem with AJ is that you're always just going to expect have such high expectations for him, mm. especially in these title matches, that maybe that's just unfair. <laughs> yeah, and, like, the problem is, again, it's not an AJ and Loki match. It's an AJ with Vince Russo and Loki match. And I think that's fine for the Raven stuff because they do incorporate the Gathering and the New Church stuff into that, into like the overall match structure. So you're not really expecting them to go out there and have like a pure wrestling contest. But when it's AJ and Loki, you do want them to go out there and have a pure wrestling contest. It's AJ and Loki. You want them to have a Ring of Honor main event. So yeah, AJ beats Loki to retain. I, I find it interesting. They never wrestle in TNA again. And like they, they do have multiple times where they're on, on the same show again. It's not like they're never in the same company anymore, but they never go back to the AJ Loki singles well. I guess by the time like Loki comes back and stuff, AJ has kind of moved on. Mm. NWA TNA pay number 59, August 20th. AJ and Russo are on vacation. Yeah, it's a great segment. So we cut to poolside at night where Vince Russo, for some reason, is sunbathing. Because it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> so AJ's talking about how he's on vacation. He's happy to be away from work for a while. Then he's like, look, look, I invented a new... Dad! Dad, look at me. I'm going to do a cool flip. It's like, I'm, I've invented a new flip. And Russo's like, you go do it, son. And AJ does like a little spiral tap looking thing into the pool. And Vince Russo's like, ah, yeah, well done. You, good job, son. He did Naito's move. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. He's, uh, he's, uh, Naito was watching this in 2003. And he's like, oh, I'll start doing this in Japan. Science press. This is the dorky AJ that you expect, huh? And that you would see more of in like the Christian Coalition era. I was imagining like the, the angles with him and, and Karen Angle. Hmm. Because, like, AJ, anytime he tries to do, like, a serious promo, which he, he tried to do a little of it with the sit-down interview with Mike Tanay, he's he's absolutely horrible. Like, you cannot you cannot speak to how bad AJ Styles is as a promo these days. He's hideous. He's absolutely terrible. Gets lost in his words. Never says anything meaningful. Gets frustrated. He, he has no idea what he's doing on any, any, any promo. So when he's just doing the goofball stuff, he actually feels like he understands what his role is. Yeah, very genuine. Later in that show, there's a segment after a Jeff Jarrett and Eric Watts against Daniels and Legend match, which we'll talk about when we get to the Jarrett and Daniels stuff. But for the most of the show, you see in the crowd, Liam, there's two people wearing a Freddy and Jason costumes. We we got worked. <laughs> They're just you're just hanging out in the crowd behind Mike Tanay and Don West, just having a good time here in the asylum. It was FMW's Freddy and Jason the Terrible. <laughs> As it turns out, Liam, Vince Russo and AJ Styles weren't on vacation. What? But we saw them. They were hiding all night in the asylum, dressed as Freddy and Jason. I hope they were there the whole time. Well, every time they cut to Mike Today and Don West on camera, they were there, so... Yeah, but they could have just walked out every time, you know? Mm, there is a note. The one in the Jason mask, who turned out to be Styles, was poking and poking Tanay when he was announcing, just as a tease to try and take him out of his game. But Tanay just thought it was an annoying fan and he ignored it. Very few, if anyone, was let in that they were doing <laughs> that gimmick, although it was known they would do the run-in after the match. The rules. Once again, working the boys. <laughs> yeah, but, like, it's funny, so this one... This one isn't, like, a big deal, so I don't mind that. Just pestering Mike Tanay a little? Yeah. I don't get the reason they were disguised, but it's not like they were banned from the building. No, because they were supposed to be on vacation. It was trying to be a surprise attack. But they could have just run out and done a surprise attack. Well, that's less impactful. This was a master plan, Garrett. Their master plan to do something they could have done anyway without the disguise. Hmm. Very, they thought this one through. But yeah, they, they <sighs> lay a bunch of people out. Well, again, we'll talk about that when we get to the Jared and Daniel stuff. And then last show of the month, there really is just the Jarrett and Raven match, mm -hmm. which is really good. NWA TNA baby number 57. This is the Jeff Jarrett and Christopher Daniels feud, which is maybe, this is one of the few things of the month I'll be like, is kind of bad. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a Jeff Jarrett feud in NWA TNA. He runs out, he beats someone up, and then someone else runs out and beats him up, and then he gets taken away or like banned or something like that. It, it's every feud that he's ever had in this company. So Daniels is doing a promo in the crowd. And poor Christopher Daniels died an absolute death in this promo. I think it's because, like, hardly anyone could hear him. And, like, the, just that the material is just horrible. For some reason, he's, like, the only dude fighting the sex battle anymore, where he's still like, traditional wrestling, it's horrible. We need metamorphosis. I'm going to say the word metamorphosis multiple times because it's the crux of my promo. Metamorphosis. And I'm still rebelling against traditional wrestling, and we need sports entertainment and metamorphosis did i say metamorphosis 
Mm. It's just, I, 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 I can't imagine anybody on Earth caring about this character. Just have him be Fallen Angel, man. <laughs> he does at least try to pander to you and go full Brian Lawler. Well, if he was knocking out fans, yeah. He, he did. A fan attacked him. No, I mean, legitimately. <laughs> oh, you, you want him to shoot punch the fan? Yes, of course. So yeah, a fan threw a drink at him, Daniels fought him, but then Jarrett made the save for the fan. <laughs> to be fair, like, it was a good beatdown on the fan. Mm-hmm. It's just, we, we've, we've set the Brian Lawler standards of break their nose. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't reach the level of break their nose, it's not a good fan attack angle. I mean, because at this point, we've done so many, you know. Mm. So you got to do it. So NWTNA paper number 58, after the Dusty and AMW against the Diamond Swinger and Gilberti match, Daniels attacks Dusty, Jarrett makes the save, Legend attacks Jarrett, Watts makes the save, and then Watts announces that he and Jarrett will face Legend and Daniels the following week. Wow. There's a lot of those like cascading series of run-ins. There's a lot of it in the Diamond and Swinger stuff. It's like, oh, Diamond and Swinger would run in, AW would run in, and then Daniels would run in, and then Dusty would run in, and then Gilberti would run in. It's like, okay. Everything that you need. So NW18, a baby number 59, we had a sit-down interview with Mike Tanay and Eric Watts, where Eric Watts tried to explain how he was made director of authority. Ooh, yeah, exactly, right? So he was telling us that there is the NWA, and there is TNA, thus NWATNA. Um, can, uh, yes, all right, all right. Slow, slow down a bit for me, please. So TNA owns 51%, which implies NWA owns 49%. Right, okay, sure. So Eric Watts is the representative of the NWA. Yeah. And Because TNA know promotion and the NWA know wrestling, that NWA are, are, are in charge of wrestling operations. Mm-hmm. So they have placed Eric Watts in charge for reasons. Mm-hmm. But the reason that Don Callis is here is because the people at TNA want to get push in on the wrestling side of things. They're getting like too big for their boots, so they, they want to make sure that the wrestling stuff is happening the way they want it to. So they have assigned Don Callis as a, a executive consultant or whatever it is, management consultant. Makes perfect sense to me. Sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, I like the idea that now the NWA is like, we have to step in. Mm. Everything else is fine, but now we have to step in. There's also, he talks about how it's like, oh, you know, me and Jeff are pals now. He's gotten where he wanted to all along, Liam. He's teaming with Jeff Jarrett. What a payoff, huh? So then we get the tag match, which is Jarrett and Watts against Daniels and Legend. Surprisingly enjoyable, honestly. Yeah, it's a fun little match. The highlight of which is Eric Watts is facing the corner at one stage. And you're like, well, what in the world is Eric Watts about to do? (laughs) What in Watts world? So he does a springboard reverse drop kick, a springboard mule kick. And it's... It's ridiculous, and I kind of love it. And he doesn't, like, Vader it very much. He just kind of jumps and does it. So yeah, because it, it, it is a little like the Vader bomb, except into a dropkick, but to the top rope, and also he just does, as you mentioned, he just kind of does it. Yeah, it's very cool. It's an absolutely wild move. This is also the match where, like, we mentioned last week that Eric Watts would be a really good tag team wrestler, and I think this match was, like, the proof of concept. This was the most of Eric Watts' chaotic energy influencing his actual in-ring work mm. for sure like i think you got you felt it in this i will say he abused his power because they did the the hot tag referee didn't see it watts returned to the corner they did it again where referee didn't see it but this time watts who is director of authority he just moved referee mike Bowles the other way and did his hot tag comeback <laughs> flagrant abuse of power here from eric watts i mean eric watts man. <laughs> just just Eric Watts. So we had the post-match angle where the red shirts ran out, Jerry Lynn cut him off, Freddie and Jason emerged from the crowd to reveal themselves as Styles and Russo, they handcuffed Watts to the rail, and then they beat the hell out of Jaff Jarrett, and then they brought him to the hearse backstage, which was there for a deal of Brown and Sonny Siaki segment that we'll talk about in a second. There's a lot of, like, we, the, these stories intersect in different periods. It's very annoying to cover in a broad way, but nonetheless. But yeah, they abduct Jeff Jarrett so he couldn't appear in the gauntlet match later that night. Like we said on the the watch along uh, them playing his music was a good little touch though because that is his spot he still had his spot in the match and it set up the raven one where it's like it made sense that they then played raven's music but then raven actually came out yeah i did quite enjoy mike Tanae shouting at the top of his lungs jeff jarrett's been abducted <laughs> like uh, something like just a real thing that someone would say you know yeah it's just for some reason it's the use of the word abducted that he was abducted uh in a pro wrestling context as well so, end of the TNA baby number 60, Jeff Jarrett has returned to get revenge. He emerges from the hearse, which I believe he was he was in the hearse all week, I guess. 
he's taking a nap. He's, he took all week to get out of the hearse, but once the hearse returns to the building, he attacks on Isiaki with a guitar, he attacks Disco with a guitar, he attacks a bunch of people with guitars. We're firmly in, like, the guitar era now, after being so sparing with it up until now. I think he hits Daniels with a guitar at one stage of the show as well, so it's like, yeah, yes. there, there is multiple guitar shots on this show. I, I'm guessing that was the point. It was meant to be like, he's got the guitar now, he's just swinging around like a maniac. But I kind of didn't notice it. <laughs> I was just like, oh yeah, there it is. So yeah, the post-match to Stalls and Raven, AMW come out and they're like, we're not going to let this go down. But th- then it just, it, it does go down. <laughs> One AMW. Well, yes, Chris Harris. Chris Harris is like, this isn't going to go down like this. First we lost the tag titles and now Raven lost like this. It's not going to happen like this. But it 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 it, it does. <laughs> I like that they let Chris Harris cut this promo, though, because it could have just easily been Jarrett. Mm, so everyone runs out, everyone makes the save. So you have everyone out there where Eric Watts jumps on the microphone and he's like, next week, it's going to be Jarrett, AMW, Raven, and D'Lo against Styles, Daniel, Shane Douglas, Diamond, and Swinger in Wednesday Bloody Wednesday, which is TNA's first War Games match. Lethal lockdown. And in a very nice touch, the inventor of War Games, Dusty Rhodes, was out there, and he is the man who will keep the key for the Wednesday Bloody Wednesday match next week. I like that he said, it's like, sounds like a little war games. And it's like, no, Dusty, no, I did quite enjoy that they made sure you knew that it's war games they're doing. It's like, just in case, we explained the rules so that you knew it's war games, but we're also going to say the words war games multiple times so that you know it's war games. Gotta get a little blood and guts. I will say, I thought they built this match quite nicely. We talked about like the, the fact that the intersecting stories was a little annoying to cover from a, a broad topics perspective, but the way they intersected these stories makes sense that they're going to bring them all together into this War Games match. Yeah, I think they did, they did a good job of wrapping it all together. Mm, so we will talk about that in the September episode, because the first show of the month is the Super X Cup and the Wednesday Bloody Wednesday War Games match. All right, some more stuff to cover. Deal on Siaki. Uh, this one's important, I think, because it's the the first instance of the TNA eulogy. Yes, so after Siaki cost Dilo the matches against AJ last month, they continue their feud this month, where Siaki decides that he's going to host a funeral for Dilo Brown's career. And Garrett, have we, have we, or would we see this again in TNA's future? TNA become very fond of funerals. <laughs> Like, that's a quintessential TNA angle. Mm. Like, not many other people do that. Or do it as well if they do do it. And, like, specifically the way TNA eventually does it. Because, like, the the way this segment plays out, which is NWA TNA paper number 59, August 20th, Siaki comes to the show with a hearse, and he's going to bury the career of Dilo Brown. So Siaki comes to the ring. He has Trinity with him. Siaki's wearing his sweet leather jacket. Trinity is dressed both appropriately and inappropriately for a funeral. It is black, but also horny. (laughs) So they do the, the eulogy, they, they're like, oh, Dilo, the, here your career rests, you're a horrible failure. And in typical pro wrestling fashion, Dilo Brown bursts out of the casket, beats the hell out of Siaki and Trinity, and then throws Siaki and Trinity into the casket themselves. And then he died. He's dead forever. Mm-hmm. So Gar- how many t- eulogy angles have there been in TNA? So we have the Aces and Eights funeral. Mm-hmm. We have the Team 3D funeral. That's my favorite. We have the Funeral of Fire, where Sue Young sets Rosemary on fire. Mm-hmm. There is, I think, an LAX and OG's funeral as well? Yes. Am I missing one? Was there, like, a, a one in the build-up to the Sting Abyss stuff? There was a Last Rites match, which is comically bad. I'm looking forward to covering it on the show, but I don't remember if there was a funeral. If you remember any other TNA funerals, hit us up at TNA History Pod on Twitter or in the, the Discord, the Voices Wrestling Discord, and our little channel there if you'd want to remind us of more TNA funerals. <laughs> and tell us what your favorite TNA funeral was. Because like this is more your standard like casket segment where the dude bursts out of the casket, which is another very satisfying for wrestling trope in its own right. Hmm. I like people bursting out of caskets. It's very enjoyable. But yeah, the, the, the TNA funeral, as we know it, I think would first come into play in the, the Team 3D funeral, which is still the best one. I'm very much looking forward to that era of TNA angle because like the TNA hit a point at, at some point where they were like, we're just going to do like, it's always sunny skits. <laughs> <laughs> like, and I don't know why, but like, those are always the things that re- like really stuck with me. Perhaps because I was like a 15 year old boy. <laughs> mm. And I was watching them and like, this rules. So last show of the month, I knew they had TNA paper number 60. Siaki defeated D'Lo after Trinity hit a DDT. Uh, nice little match. Nothing special, but I thought it was a good little two and a half star match. Mm-hmm. Okay, Kid Cash. What's he up to this month, Liam? He's beating up legends again. And then he's getting betrayed. 
So last month, if you remember, Kid Cash faced Ricky Morton on the last show of the month. So he continues his feud with Legends on NWA TNA pay number 57, where he faces the returning Larry Zabisco. I thought this was kind of good. I thought both of the, particularly because the, the second, the following show he faces Ricky Morton. In a match that I was actually really disappointed about how short it was, because it's like, oh, I'm enjoying this. And then they just go, oh, sorry, Bobby Eaton, not Ricky Morton. He faced Ricky Morton last week. So yeah, he's he's wrestling Bobby Eaton. They're having like a really nice little match. And then it just kind of ends anticlimactically. I'm like, oh, I wish they got more time. Yeah, um, Eaton was good in that. And I, I love that his, um, his pacing around the ring at the start of the match. Mm. Like, he knew, like, this kid was younger and had more in the tank and was more athletic. So he's, like, raring to go to get the advantage. I thought that was really cool. I quite appreciated that um, Larry Z did a little curtsy for the lollipop as he made his entrance. Yes, he was, he's a wonderful man. They're very respectful. Cash beat Larry Z after a black hole slam from Abyss, where Abyss planted Larry with that black hole slam. Mm. This is a good month for black hole slams. Really stuck him. Because I think Larry didn't, like, Larry is both old and heavy, so he didn't do, like, the kind of seamless graceful rotation so Abyss just like dropped him and it ruled mm. <laughs> so yeah next show it's Bobby Eaton making his TNA debut his only TNA appearance where he wrestles Kid Cash again Abyss interferes Cash wins but yeah, I really wish they they got more out of this because I thought they were having a nice little match before it just kind of anticlimactically ended yeah again they did do the Midnight Express knockout team so there you go I'm a big fan of the legend killer Kid Cash <laughs> was Randy doing that story at this stage he would have been, right? I mean, maybe it was the very, like, very formations of it. Mm. Stole the angle from Kid Cash. Mm. I quite... Had um, Randy Orton beat up Mark Cuban yet? That happened, right? I'm not just imagining that. He did He did do that. I don't remember, but it's WWE story, so I, I just don't remember. Yeah, Randy Orton, Akio's Mark Cuban, Survivor Series 2003. There you go. I know because I watched Survivor Series 2003. <laughs> it was at that moment that Mark Cuban was like, I'm going to start a pharmaceutical company instead of starting a wrestling company. Yeah. I quite enjoyed Don West on commentary. He's just like, you know, Mike, I usually like enjoy most people, but this kid cash guy's a real son of a bitch. Yeah. Two months ago, he was talking about how he like gets sexual gratification for beating up women. Mm. He's not a good person. In fact, quite a bad person. Is kid cash ever a baby face in this company ever again? Um, not really. If he is, it's for a short period. Good. <laughs> NWA TNA pay number 59, August 20th, Kid Cash and Abyss are both in the gauntlet match. As mentioned, Abyss eliminates Kid Cash. <gasps> and then we're like, oh, what does this mean for their relationship? Abyss is a man on his own. Uh, kind of. Yes, uh, we learn he, maybe he's not. So there was Abyss against Sandman on the last show of the month where Kid Cash interfered, tried to hit a Rana on Abyss through a table. Table didn't break. I Okay, I kind of like the Sandman match mm-hmm. um, because... And it really hit me here. Abyss sells and moves around a lot like young Mick Foley. Mm. Like, just the way he moves. He has, like, this kind of wide gait as he goes. He's a cool crazy. He has his arms all, like, flared out. I think, um, yeah, I, just, I got real big uh, Foley vibes in this. And it's interesting that you can track the two forms of Foley, where it's, like, the kind of wrestler Foley, hardcore Foley, in the same way you can track Abyss, where it's, like, the wrestler Abyss and the hardcore yeah. Abyss. And they're very similar. Obviously, Mick Foley is Abyss's hero, I believe, so it makes a lot of sense, but... Ah, well, there you go. Well, then, um, fair play to Abyss, because he, he does manage to capture the same ethos and the same kind of aura as Foley does. And it would be a knock against Abyss for years that people saw him as, like, a, a cheap mankind knockoff. Hmm. Well, that's silly. <laughs> Just because he wears a mask and wrestles like Mick Foley. <laughs> and eventually both wrestles and teams with Mick Foley in TNA. Mm, I think he's a Hulk Hogan knockoff. Yeah, that makes more sense. So, yeah, uh, Cash tries to interfere. He hits a Rana through a table. But, the, again, table didn't break. But Abyss just gets back in the ring and wins. It looks gnarly, though. It did. And the fact that he gets up and just wins kind of makes him look like a badass, too. Also, Sandman hit a swanton bomb in this match. And it was like a total finesse-less swanton bomb. Every time he does it, it's like he falls off on him. He just lands with the thuddiest of thuds. And it's it's like it's perfect for the Sandman. That's how the man should hit a swanton bomb. But it looks like it, it's absolute shit to take. Yeah, it looks like he crushes him. So after the match, we go backstage where Terry Taylor is getting in the face of Kid Cash. They're, they're, they're getting stuck into each other. Kid Cash slaps Terry Taylor, but before Terry Taylor can retaliate, Abyss steps between them. So apparently the mind control has kicked back in. The mind control. That's Even my today, Don West is like, it's like mind control. Yeah. So Abyss and Cash are on the same page. Question mark? For now. And then the last real thing this month is Mad Mikey. Mad Mikey did a couple of things. Yeah, so he did the skit one more time. Yeah, so he did a, a vignette on the first show of the month where he was mad at people playing basketball. It's like, God damn it, these people are tall. 
Fair. He was mad about people who won't take his call, and then he was mad about his roommate drinking his milk, so he locked his roommate in the fridge. Which, to be fair, I would be all for. Then there was a montage of him being mad, included like women pushing him into a pool. <laughs> yeah. He's just getting bullied. Mm. My, my favourite one this month was the following show, pay-per-view number 58, where they went to play his latest Mad Mikey is Very Mad at Things skit. And then there was like technical difficulties and they cut to the truck where he's just beating the shit out of the people in the truck as they screwed up his pre-tape. <laughs> and then he just like whines. Upset and whining and upset. This is great foreshadowing for when James Mitchell can't get his headset to work. <laughs> we didn't mention that. It was the Tree Live Crew segment, I believe. Yeah. Tree Life Crew against the new church where they were meant to have Mitchell on commentary. And Mike is like, can we turn on James Mitchell's headset? James Mitchell's headset, not working. He says it like six times. He's literally there and he's like, can we get a new headset for James Mitchell? He's just like, will you fix this, you stupid idiots? And then I just end up giving him a microphone. And then he speaks like four words and leaves. <laughs> yeah, he's probably pissed off. But Mad Mikey tries to enter the gauntlet match, but he's not in it. And he's just really pissing off Mike and A on commentary. <laughs> And he just runs in. And then gets eliminated. Because, sure. Even though he's not in the match, so I guess he can't be eliminated. Hmm. I did enjoy just how agitated Mike Tanae was getting, because Mikey was over by the announce table shouting at them, and Mike Tanae was like, I cannot focus on this match with this man shouting at me. It's such a, like, a, a bad day, too, because, like, he had, like it was the next week he was getting poked in the back, too, so Jesus. My... No, that was the same show. He was just getting... It was a bad, Mike, bad day for Mike Tanae. He's getting poked by people in the crowd. Like, Mad Mike, he's yelling at him. Just being agitated from all angles. Mm. And speaking of being agitated, last show of the month, Mike Tanae sat down with Mad Mikey to try to get to the bottom of his anger issues. Yeah, it was kind of a nice little therapy session. He's like, I'm the one of the most decorated stars in wrestling history, and I'm going to prove it by winning a title here in the NWA TNA. He also said, like, he's like, I'm one of the most decorated stars in wrestling history, but I'm also one of the biggest losers. Yeah, then he steals Mike Tanae's shoes and has a freak out. <laughs> Some good Mike Tanae faces here too. Oh, uh, the the one that closes on where he's just like aghast at this man in front of him, like doing the full Christian temper tantrum while holding one of Mike Tanae's shoes in his hand. Great stuff. Great Mike Tanae right there. Mike Tanae. All right, that's all we have for broad topics. Very quickly, let's go through show by show. NWA TNA favorite number 57. Do you have anything from this one? N- not really. Just that, um... I like pre-match promos from Danny Dory and Joey Matthews because they were both just like, we are here in the TNA. <laughs> yeah, it's like, hello, you ha- you have barely seen us. We are going to win. Danny Dory kind of like buried TNA a little bit, which is always a fun thing. I like Larry Zabisco and Kid Cash too. I really, Zabisco has been um, really enjoyable every time he's wrestled. Mm. There was a Watts line while he was doing a promo on the show where he is like, I don't want Russo involved sexually. It's like, all right, Eric. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, okay, first of all, yeah, why would you assume? <laughs> Yeah. You think quite highly of yourself, Eric Watts. And we have paper number 58, weirdly opened with no opening video. Very strange. But good. Oh, I, I forgot to mention, the first show of the month, they actually ran out of time on the cage match angle. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, yeah, because the mid-Russo promo, they cut him off. Yeah, so they ran out of time. They pulled the plug on Vinny Roo, and they did show it the following week, where basically Russo did a promo. Daniels came out, joined Team Russo, or Team Styles, and then Jarrett made the save. That was the angle. But yeah, they ran out of time. Hmm. And then um, we have the note on the next show that there was some heat in the audience because nobody had ever heard of the conference skating signs, but they took out who booked this crap sign before the show. Which, to be fair, I can't blame them. Yeah, but also, who did book this crap? Well, we know it's some combination of Jeff Jarrett, Vince Russo, Scott Demore, and Glenn Gilberti, so... There you go. Choose who you would like to blame. I know who I'm blaming. <laughs> and also giving credit to... NWA TNA Baby number 59, the one we did for a watch along that's on tnachad.com right now in the Kingdom of the Mountain tier if you'd like to hear our full reactions to it while Liam also played Yu Gi Oh! Yeah. How are you finding the Yu Gi Oh! It's uh, really good and you don't have to spend any real money. That is always a plus. Yeah, which is, was everyone's big concern because Konami is a greedy, greedy company. <laughs> in so many ways. Hmm. All in all, it's uh, very good. Some things that need to be updated, but that'll come with time. It's a free-to-play game, so, you know, it'll be updated as we go. So there's your Yu-Gi-Oh! update for NWTNA February number 59. Yeah. Who would be the best duelist? Uh, it's Chris Saban, for sure. Oh, yeah, he's he's a duel master. He's the heart of the cards. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> and then NWA TNA pay-per-view number 60 last show of the month I did quite enjoy there was a moment in I believe it was the Diamond and Swinger against AMW match where Rudy Charles missed two low blows just by happening to look in a different direction <laughs> yeah um, there's a reason the crowd have turned on him because <laughs> he is a, a, a divisive figure here Rudy 
I wouldn't say divisive. I just like people don't like him. He's making unpopular decisions. He's stealing belts. And like, it, it, watch it. There, there's a moment where he does a low blow where he just happens to look outside. I guess it's good refereeing in a way where he's trying to maintain the integrity of his position as an official where he just happens to like look out to the floor during the low blow. It's like, why didn't you just incorporate it into the match anymore? It doesn't matter. But I think also the point is meant to be that he's like the shifty ref. Even though he's the senior official. Because they kind of play into it with the last show of the month too during that big segment where um, Harris is cutting his promo about how he has to restart the match or get thrown out or reverse the decision. Raven clearly wasn't listening to that James Mitchell promo because he had his candles again on this show. <gasps> it's clearly summoning some more demons. He, uh, uh, Judas Macias will come out next. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, probably worth mentioning. Roddy Piper. Oh uh, yeah. That, listen, I... Who knows what that's going to be? So yeah, there's on 59, there's a Piper teaser, and then there's a more express, it's Roddy Piper coming on 60, and he's pissed off, Liam. He's like Mad Mikey. I mean, also, Don West says it's Roddy Piper. Yeah, that's that's also a, a bit of a tell. It's a little weird. Uh, Chris Harris rocks. I, I just want to say Chris Harris rocks. Sure. Everything he does rules. His, his left arm clothesline, I think I've said this before, but like the way he leaves the ropes the second he hits them and like flies three quarters of the way across the ring to hit his left arm lariat, so good. Yeah. And Raven had, like, the big dramatic entrance music. They do that for, like, the big match, uh, title matches where Raven, or Styles and Jarrett have had it. But now Raven got his. That's it. I'm out of notes. You got anything else? The only thing we have is that, like, apparently no one else wanted to do the gauntlet match. <laughs> oh, yeah. The other members of the writing team were not in favor of holding the gauntlet match last week. But Jeff Jarrett stood his ground and insisted that it be part of the show. And he was right. Very good part of the show. Good job, Jeff. Jeff. See, that's why you need to have someone who, uh, someone who can actually make the call and be like, no, fuck you. I'm in charge. Mm. And also, for when Diamond and Swinger won the tag belts, JB, who can't get his rating defending right, accidentally nearly announced new uh, World Tag Team Champions America's Most Wanted. And I was like, oh. Jesus Christ. Diamond and Swinger. Jesus. They should honestly, I don't know if they do it, but next week they should be like, oh, a typical JB. He loves AMW so much, even when they lost, he tried to announce them as winners. This guy. Because that's the story. It would be funny if they incorporated it into the story. They won't. They won't at all. That is August 2003 in the NWA TNA. Pun, sir? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I got distracted. Someone was making noise outside my window. <laughs> Is it threatening noises or just people outside? Just people outside. Oh, okay. <laughs> Someone on the phone, and I was like, "Who's on the phone?" <laughs> but yes, we're done. That's the that's the month. We'll be back in two weeks, where we will be talking about September, which, as mentioned, includes the first Super X Cup, which includes the first War Games, like the lockdown, <laughs> which we saw all the build through this month. So come back in two weeks for that. Next week, we'll be back with our next episode of Ring Cat Kings. That'll be on Patreon, patreon.com slash kidding me or tnhad.com where you can get the watch along of nwa tna 59 you can get the show notes for the show or star ratings from this month as well head to patreon patreon.com slash kidding me tnhad.com follow us on twitter at tna history pod follow me on twitter at gary kidney follow liam on twitter at the Gleet muta thanks for listening and bye bye let's hope that this will be the last month that we have to see another d lo aj styles match